Okay, so uh, I don't even know how to introduce this. So yeah, okay. today me and uh, this person, <laughs> <laughs> literally who? No. <laughs> yeah, literally who? <laughs> uh, so yeah, uh, introduce yourself. Okay, uh, my name is No Eyes Fiend or Noise Fiend. Um, I go by he him away from the art you know, art music stuff and uh, they them within the confines of the project. Um, I make industrial noise and uh, I've been producing and stuff uh, for about two or three years now. And uh, I've been a fan of industrial music since I was roughly 14 years old. So I've got about 15 years of listening, studying and assessing industrial music. Um, I have a little bit of formal music education, a uh, very small amount. Other than that, mostly just self-taught. And uh, I did go to college for psychology uh, just for two years before I dropped out. Um, I feel like that's a succinct background. Um, yeah. <laughs> My grandfather used to said that uh, people go to school for psychology should have their head checked. I agree with your grandfather. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm the machine kills music. I talk about edgy stuff. I don't know what I do. <laughs> <laughs> but you're here. But yes, um, today we're going to talk about uh, the latest. Well, I should say latest. Um, basically, <laughs> non binary. Uh, the memoir that came out this year, I believe. Yes. Uh, by. The late Genesis P. Orich. So, yeah, uh, basically we got at the same time and I decided, yeah, we should just talk about it because I, th I don't know. I thought it'd be a really good discussion. Plus, now that I have, I think I mentioned this in a video, now that I have records, I can, yes. fin I can finally do um, a dream project. One of the reasons I made my channel to do a comparing of these two and now we have this for the mixture although i don't know how much this is going to contribute to the actual narrative so <laughs> we'll see about that. <laughs> you know so i guess we'll we'll start this with like staying a few things up front first of all um, we're going to do our best we, as far as pronouns go, because Genesis Peorage consider themselves uh, pandrogynous, which is a perfect, what they believe was a perfect merging of male and female, their art project, their soul, their life, and basically it was a comp, pronouns a lot of people referred to them as they, and they preferred they, them, so, but many people still prefer referred to Genesis as he and she, pretty much any pronoun they're comfortable with this. So sometimes we'll try not to slip up because I do like they for them, but I'm also still reading Cozy's book, which most people still refer to Jen as he. So it's kind of in my brain right now, reading about them, <laughs> reference to Jen. Plus a lot of people, when they reference Jen in the past, they say he, um, even the compiler of this book, says that so but yeah <laughs> and fair. yeah and that anything I don't want to say negative but any criticism you know towards Jen starving girl all that has nothing to do with their legacy and influence for many people and artists and you know their influence in the LGBT plus community any of that um at the end of the day everything genesis has done for all these communities has been a lot and immense and it is a great loss to lose them but you know we also need to talk about them not being 100 percent who they say they are and you know giving voice to people who may have had problems with them some serious problems as well speaking the truth <laughs> yeah, uh, like even the greatest people aren't, you know, immune to criticism or any sort of um, reassessments. So, yeah, there is. 
I think I wrote it down. There is a line that Genesis wrote in here about um, Aleister Crowley, and it's kind of weird because it's almost as if they are talking about themselves. By the way, so I have all these for the audience. I have all these metal tab. These are all like stuff that I found worthwhile talking about <laughs> in this book. But yeah, Genesis had a quote about Aleister Crowley, and I think it applies to them. And then there was Aleister Crowley. I had been reading about magic since getting hold of Diary of a Drug Fiend, Moonchild, and the Confessions by Crowley. Spidey had found out about Crowley back at Soul Hole and told me about him. And then I read about Crowley in Oz and International Times. He seemed interesting, but the more I read about him, the more I thought he was a dick. He was a misogynist and a bully. There's a lot of clear evidence about him. The mistake people made in the 1960s was always the same. Crowley was interesting, so that means Crowley is great. But it also can go the other way. Crowley was a dick. But that doesn't mean everything he said was stupid. You have to pick out bits that seem relevant and practical. Yeah, that's... uh. <laughs> <laughs> from from what I know of Jen outside of this, I would agree with um, that self-assessment. Uh, <laughs> and uh, for the benefit of the viewers, I will say I own everything so far that uh, this machine's shown. So here's my copy of uh, Non-Binary, and here's the handbook and stuff. But um, yeah, so... It's it's kind of weird. Jen talks about projecting and ma self manifestation a lot, uh, not just in this book, but in general. And the fact that they would look at Aleister Crowley and come to that sort of conclusion, but then live the life they did, and <laughs> like we honestly don't know how much Tim Rohr, uh, the collaborator of this book. Uh, decided to edit out himself but based off of how well everything flows it seems like uh, Jen picked the shiniest pieces of their memory um, oddly enough not the best or greatest parts in my opinion and chose to display those yeah also I, I forgot another thing to mention that um, we also have to take into account too that Jen wrote this when they were very ill, when yeah. they had come down with leukemia. So it's a bit hard to assess the content and everything about it in that way as well. As being like a memoir or autobiography, it's pretty dry. It's pretty bland. It doesn't feel like a lot happens. Or like I really was not like I. I felt blindsided by all the stories about Jen's father. Like, and they even make an anime reference right from the get go on page five. They're like, uh, but even before I could include a roar of approval from his fellow fledging delinquents in my imagination, he added another tasty morsel about himself that took me to a whole new level of ultra violent anime. And then his father says, I used to have a thick wooden cut down stick slid inside my right boot in case our group got in a fight with any other bikers. Yeah, I knew I remember that. The word anime, I was very <laughs> perplexed. <laughs> just kind of like just all, all of Jen's um, inclusion of their father in this was really uh really a blind side um but yeah from from the perspective of uh like you you said uh information the early childhood stuff was somewhat new uh i felt like we'd been drip fed some of it over the years like here yeah. and there in interviews but um Throughout the book, like there, there came a point where it just became a slog because if it was less informative than a Wikipedia page, like at one point. Yeah, it's it's written just very weirdly. It's not like intimate enough 
because I don't, when it comes to like memoirs, autobiographies, um, I don't really care so much with the writing. I remember there was criticism towards Cozy's book because the way she writes, it's from her diary. It was like not how an author writes. It's not the prose wasn't good enough. I'm like, who the fuck cares? Like, really? Right. Um, also, they're British. No, I'll edit that out. We need to edit that out. <laughs> no, I think you should keep it in. Also, they're British, so it's boring. <laughs> no. Uh, uh, oh, go ahead, so, go ahead. So it's something. Um, but, so yeah, it wasn't, like I said, I don't really care about the pros, but it's weird because I feel like they tried to, like, do some, like, tried to write a little bit, like, well, but was in between. Sometimes I do it, sometimes it was intimate, sometimes it wasn't, sometimes it was very matter of fact. Sometimes, yeah, it did feel like a, a Wikipedia, like a third person writer and not Jen writing it. Um, also, the way they the way they shift, because I know Jen would, would say, like, we, we and stuff, referring to the Pandrogeny soul, kind of like... <laughs> <laughs> doing some Anne Rand anthem here where they don't say I, they say we. But it's not consistent at all. And it's mixed up and it's a little bit weird. And if you didn't know that about Jen uh, going into this book, you'd be a little bit confused too, I think. Yeah. Um, even even though like I read the Psychic Bible back in high school and, you know, like following along with the Jennies or however they refer to his uh their special lingual is uh it, it was difficult but it's like even as a high schooler once you make that adjustment you're like yeah i'm good because the of uh they them s slash he you know like all the weird symbols and incorporations it, it starts to flow and make sense because the tone is mostly consistent throughout their writing but when you're reading this book, it, it feels choppy. And I, I kind of like some part of me wants to believe that's because they tried to utilize the cut up method somehow, or maybe the collaborator, Tim, uh, tried to use the cut up method, but then the logical side of me comes in and is like, you know, that's not what happened. <laughs> like, yeah. I'm not sure. Let's see. I'm not sure who, edit this who fact checked this who thought this is okay yeah. uh i mean i know i i feel like our thoughts are or my thoughts are a bit scattered here i should probably just do an overview but this book feels very scattered i'll try to just say the whole thing so yes this is a memoir that goes through genesis peorge's life kind of starts from you know birth childhood going through school um going through coom transmissions uh, the living situations, the relationships. Um, I don't know why I'm having a brain fart. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, a little briefly it, through um, psychic television. Yeah, yeah, a br very briefly for psychic. Barely touched on that. That's another thing too. This book just doesn't really go in depth to anything, and I think the editor tried to explain it that it was supposed to be about like the relationships and the people surrounding Jen's life and stuff like that but none of it goes into depth none of it such even like stuff like ooh, just knock this out even stuff like the coom transmissions like cozy's book goes into it for like over 100 pages like we're still i'm yeah. almost on page 200 and we're still in depth about coom transmissions all their performances what they do talking about other people, what they did. They actually have names and voices in her book. Um, yeah. Also, well, oh, sorry, my tab is all messed up. Also, for uh, reference, too, I can't help but, or I'll probably be bringing up Cozy's book a lot, um, <laughs> Art, Sex, Music, that came out in 2017. This Great book. Is, fantastic I, I could go on all day this deserves its own video and it will have one but to me this is the premier book on all things robin gristle in the history and coom transmissions too this is all great and i will be referencing this because um this 
you know, this contradicts a lot of things that Genesis said that you we will discover and find out. And I don't want, you know, I don't want to get into anyone saying like this is a he said she said thing because it's not because this is all from cozy um, Fanny Tootie's diary entries that she kept the whole time, and from what everybody else says and everybody who's there, whatever what she says is true. And Jen is Jen likes to exaggerate stuff as you find out reading non-binary. Well, and I, I, oh, sorry, go ahead sorry and i think that's one of the main issues with this book i went into this very open-minded because i know about jen because i read this book when it came out and the things that they say they are and the things that are actually what they've done to people and things they do are obviously very different but you know i wanted to hear their side see what they said maybe there'd be some humility maybe they confess like maybe you know jen actually writing this memoir of your life will be like you know i did this and that and all that, like, I wanted to see what they had to say, you know, and I also really just want to know about them, especially their family, which has kind of always been a bit more private, surprisingly, <laughs> like, their children, and all of that, <laughs> the time in Tibet, like, I wanted to know, but no, <laughs> this was very much Genesis Peorage, Illusions of Grandeur, <laughs> and I cannot believe this was approved, some of the stuff they say. Um... Yeah, I I kind of I'm basically just going to reaffirm that because I so uh, let me put it out there that Jen's been a huge influence on me artistically and in in forming my like thoughts and opinions on magic and psychology and, and a lot of different things. But just opening up to a random ass page in this thing, this old <laughs> thin, you know, little collection of interviews. There were immediate contradictions between what Jen was saying in there and what Jen was saying in here. Now, their thoughts on, like, the importance of Crawley and Burroughs and et cetera, et cetera, like, that, that's all the same, but the importance of Sleazy, of Cozy, of Chris, like, the people that were immediately around them, in this book, it's downplayed and... In, yeah, and within Industrial Handbook, Jen says sleazy is immensely important to psychic TV versus here it's, you know, here in non-binary, it's, oh, yeah, sleazy decided to basically tag along with me. Um, like, the just, it, it's just irritating because all of these people around Jen you know, like they, they all converged together and then they went off and still did amazing, great things. And Jen's just like, nah, I was the best. It was all me, you know? Yeah. It, it's very, uh, self, uh, self grandizing. So. Yeah. Well, the stuff Jen says about the other throbbing gristle members is not just untrue. It's not, it's almost like slander. <laughs> the way, they talk about the other people. Um, also, in case someone didn't, I suppose we should have said this first. If you didn't know who Genesis Peorage was, it's Robin <laughs> Gristle somehow. But, you know, they could Why be. Why are you here? <laughs> Robin Gristle is um, considered the, the first, one of the first industrial um, groups ever of the industrial music genre. And Genesis Peorage went on to do Psychic TV as well. And then members from Robin Gristle became Coil. And Chris and Cozy, you know. But don't worry, there's two other industrial products that came at the same time. People only say one. Clock DVA exists. I swear to God. It's not, they're not some fever dream I made up. It's, it's Robin Gristle, Cabaret Voltaire, Clock DVA. Clock DVA? What, what's that? No. <laughs> um, I think that's another thing, too, that Jen loved to say all the time was that they were like the sole inventor of industrial music. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, yeah, yeah, like they they give themselves the I am the industrial I... father. Um, but I will say early on, I don't have the page number marked down. It should be like between page nine and 17, probably like page 10 or so. Uh, they talk about industrial really started with World War Two. And I th think that's interesting because... Um, uh, 
Neubauten's Lament album was uh, Blixa, as Blixa explained it, he said that um, it was uh, everything that led to World War I, the international conflict and nations uh, basically being at each other's throats and the uh, intersocial noise that made has never ended. And so, yeah. you know, and th that's totally divorced because as far as I know, Blixa and Jen don't or never talked. So for Jen to say it started in World War II and Blixa to say it started in World War One, I, I just thought that was a really cool kind of uh, parallel thought, even after, you know, decades of separation. So. Yeah, there's um probably going to write like a whole thing on this. There <laughs> is the whole idea, uh, very serious about that. People don't, some people forget too that a lot of these original industrial artists are children or grew up in World War II, children in the aftermath. There's actually one of my, there's one of the, there's a line in Cozy's book that always stuck with me about, because she grew up in Hull, which was one of the towns that's completely blew out by air raids in World War II. They were just surrounded by this. She says on page six, the sheer destruction caused by the bombing of Hull meant that bombed out buildings were everywhere me and my friends wanted to play in as children. These bomb sites, which held such fascination for me, were our playgrounds, and we'd fantasize with the people who had once lived there. Toys, pianos, kitchens left almost intact. The tatted wallpaper on the remaining wall of a house complete with fireplace, half a staircase, or a small piece of bedroom floor hanging precautiously. I don't know how any of us escaped injury, climbed rickety steps, and across broken floorboards. So, you know, they grew up. So, and if you know, like, even if you know the history of New Bowden, they lived in slums that were discarded or places after world war ii there's a lot of there's a lot of connections yeah no like I, my dad told me at one point you know as even just a gen xer he's like oh yeah we were always told you know the soviets could just fucking drop shit and boom it's over because if they drop one we drop one they drop another one you know um so it it feels kind of like um that whole, like, all three of those generations, so the people coming home from the war, the baby boomers, and then the Gen Xers are just left with these psychic scars that um, our generation and the next one, and then I don't know if we're at the start of a new one yet or what, but mm. we're, we're all trying to deal with just these gigantic psychic scars left in society and that's something that i love about industrial is that it's like this exploratory process of basically being exposed to the horrors of war without the danger of it i mean um yeah like <clears throat> like I, I don't know i i feel like i've been um desensitized to a lot of things because of industrial culture and stuff. Um, so when Jen starts like relaying his uh, father's um, World War II stories, it kind of feels like a, <laughs> sorry, my girlfriend's doing stuff. <laughs> That's funny. Um, anyways, it feels kind of like a, uh, a film reel just starts playing in my head and the whole time I basically just soundtrack it with industrial with throbbing gristle and SPK. Um, like before there's even a mention of SPK in here, which I think there was only like maybe one or two versus cozy. They were a pretty heavy supporting cast. Um, yeah. I, I was thinking slow gun, we will win. <laughs> so yeah, it, it, yeah, it, it, it ties in um, that, you know, industrial probably will never fully shed that war association or that military aesthetic. Even when you go into um, like some industrial acts call themselves uh, psychedelic industrial, but they still have that tinge of like, blood and bullets and things like that so overall feel all right so i guess we should just overall feeling this book is i don't think it's a good introduction to tg i don't think it's a good introduction to kum transitions i don't even think it's a good introduction to jen 
Because even with all the stuff that Cozy said, the negative stuff that Jen had did to co talk about it, she still has positive things and talks about stuff that he did and achieved and things he stuffed. So th- even her book is still better insight too of all the stuff he accomplished. Um, there are some things I liked about the book. There were moments where Jen would say stuff that I agreed with, little insights that I thought were very um, interesting. I marked some of them. One of the first ones of the book, actually, was they say, um, the first chapter, by age 17, I had a revelation that life and art were inseparable, indivisible. To really know what was going on around you, you had to locate control and those entities with the vested interest in maintaining their tight grasp on it. And then you had to take it apart as best you could. You had to cut it up, break it into pieces, and reveal the ugly interior. Which is a lot what industrial does. And I like to... One of their reasons for writing this memoir as well... Actually, it's on the opposite page. They have to say... um, When you have terminal illness, you think that... what You think about what your legacy might be. Our only answer is we would hope that it would inspire people to see what they can live a life totally as they would like it to unfold. We've never believed in an audience, really. Our work has always been built upon finding out how to knowingly include them. This book is no different. Um, which which is true. That is 100% actual accurate thing. Uh, Throbbing Gristle, Psychic TV, a lot of industrial acts, so especially those ones, were very audience-focused. It's about getting them involved. I mean, Psychic TV was basically a, a cult. <laughs> yeah, like, um, no cutting and- about it. <laughs> And early Coombe Transmission stuff, which was the art performance group before uh, Throbbing Gristle, was all about audience interaction um, and how they reacted to these weird things that Genesis and Cozy would do. Um, and lots of other people. There's a huge vast of people that came in and out of Coombe Transmissions and that helped with Jen and Cozy's life, which you get a little bit in Jen's book. Uh, but you hardly get to know them. Like I said, there's so much voice and character and cozies and talking about them, which is so much better. And Jen just downplays so many people's stuff in this book and twists their words. Um, it's, it's really weird. I think one of the worst things is when they like, they twist like Monty Casaza's words in their feelings towards Throbbing Gristle, which just aren't true. The other members, Throbbing Gristle. Which, um, real quick, remind me, didn't Monty Casa help out at some point with XTG? Yeah. Yeah. So that's kind of strange, isn't it? That he would be <laughs> so um, dead set on the dissolution of. TG, but then came and helped when Jen backed out of... Oh, oh, okay. Okay, S- sorry. Do, do you mind if I jump back and give my quick overview, and then I'll catch up with you real quick? Yeah. yeah no, now, your thoughts and feelings in the book. That's that's what I just said mine, and then here's yours. Okay, so yeah. uh, my quick thoughts and feelings on the book. Uh, so, I feel like this is a pretty like if I feel like for the average person who knows nothing about Jen, this is a pretty bad introduction to them. Uh, but if you're a Jen fanboy or fan, they or fan girl or what have you, um, you'll love this because all it is is Jen's uh, early career highlights and mm-hmm. a couple of late career highlights. Um, but as far as what Jen's done and who they've interacted with and their actual um, effect on music and stuff, it actually downplays all of that, um, which is very strange how it can be so self-serving but still downplay what's important because just a quick discog glance Jen's listed uh, under one name or another on something like seven or eight hundred releases, you know, notes and things. Yeah, it's it's ridiculous. But uh, they only name drop like the most important people in their eyes. And so lots of William S. Burroughs, um, lots of Geisen, 
Um, they say Derek Jarman is, was a member of Exploding Galaxies, um, which was the art collective they were part of before Coom. So uh, yeah, this is this is very strange, uh, but not that great. Uh, and if you want a better introduction to Jen as an important figure, uh, re researches or re search uh, V Veil, the Throbbing Gristle issue, or the Industrial Handbook, or even Modern Primitives. Like all of those things modern are better. Yeah. Wikipedia is better. Um, yeah, Wikipedia. Um, but really, the like, the authority, even painting him in a uh, painting them in a negative light, Cozy's book just far and away trumps this book in yeah. every way. Um, I would say this too, but ain't no one ever gonna get this uh, as an hey, introduction. <laughs> a certain somebody put a PDF copy of that on the internet, so you're welcome, internet. Uh, <laughs> yes. Um, this just oh, uh, one of the first contradictions in Cozy, like you said about the exploding galaxy on page mm -hmm. fifty nine of Art Sex Music. Cozy says, it's been said that Jen was in the Exploding Galaxy, but not according to the original member, Jill Drower, who has said the performance artist Genesis Peorage was never part of the original Exploding Galaxy. The Exploding, oh, uh, the, exploding, oh, sorry, the Exploding Galaxy had disbanded in their house, sold by the time Jen arrived in London. But he did join the offshoot Transmedia Explorations, headed by Fitz Gerald Fitzgerald. If you want to cut over to my screen, I've got it pulled up right now. Yeah. <laughs> uh, just one Technology. of the many. Just one of the many lovely, um, nice contradictions. Jen just really likes to play themselves up and say things, because um. This is something, it's not just Jen, I'll say. This is something when you really get into industrial that um, it's pretty unreliable narrators all around, which is kind of the fun of it. But um, that's why this book is great, because it's, it's pretty on, it's just her diary entries, you know, and pretty much everyone else contributing, which is accurate. Probably the most accurate we'll get of anything in this group but <laughs> you know until like it, until 10 years from now uh like threshold house comes out with the unabridged history and it's just thousands of hours of tapes that sleazy had been recording secretly without telling anyone and it's like he conversations <laughs> he probably fucking did he probably did <laughs> I will. I will say I love that both books when they mention Sleazy's introduction talk about how like just super clean cut and professional and small he was, and like he literally just slides in to to like both. Cozy's book says they were just eating lunch at one of their shows, and he showed up. And Jen said he was like doing something, and Sleazy blocked his path or some stuff. But like, either way, it was like he just slides in the view. Uh, the shadows. I don't know. So, <laughs> I just thought that was fun. Let me let me see because it, uh, first off, you get to say nice because the first note I have on sleazy is page one sixty nine. So nice. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Actually, that's uh, speaking of fun fact. That's sleazy saying nice and twenty jazz fun greats. That's that's him in the in the in the title track or the opening track. <laughs> <laughs> exploding it, it's which is special because he rarely did any vocals for stuff so that's him going yeah nice <laughs> so 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 sleazy was very this is a complete tangent sleazy was very into psychedelics and you know about time machines by time machines right mm -hmm. it, it just it seems like uh 
Sleazy and Jeff really did hit upon some like spiritus mundi at one point, and they're just <laughs> everywhere throughout history because um, I tried to capture this with you on t- uh, a Twitter back and forth. Um, but yeah, um, okay, so the first mention is 168, but my first note was 169. But Jen talks about Sleazy's dad was on the Anola Gay, which I couldn't find a definitive proof other than mention of a professor, which Sleazy's dad was from England. Well, two professors, but from England being on board the Anola Gay and the birth date of one of the pilots is the same was it birthday or death day of sleazy? I want to say it was the same birthday as sleazy, like 23 years later or something like that. It was just, uh-huh. it was fucking weird. I, I don't know. I, I started tripping out because yeah, it's like yeah, 23 uh, time machines, infinity. Uh, anyways. um, Yeah. <laughs> People say Sleazy's dad was also knighted. I don't actually know what he's knighted for, and um, I'm, with, I'm working on the coil iceberg, so it'd be nice. Oh, so yeah. it it would seem even for Jen, it would seem kind of weird to lie about someone else's like parents or dad. So it could possibly be true. Oh, uh, I actually found so. Right at the moment, as I sighed, resentful at my fate, wishing Coom had our own road crew to do this, a remarkable being I'd learn later was Peter Martin Christofferson came edging up to me, sliding sneakily closer and entering my personal space. That I can believe. <laughs> Genesis, he said. <laughs> mumbling at the floor as if slightly embarrassed. My name is Peter, and I believe you know William S. Burroughs. <laughs> oh, 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 okay, okay. Uh, I've actually got the passage where she first says sleazy. So. Okay, let's re- bring up, uh, let's bring up when Cozy eats sleazy. So fun. Okay, here we go. You got it on screen? Yeah. Okay. The cooming of age at the Oval House Theater in London was the first coom action that involved nudity. It proved to be a huge turning point as it also caught the attention of someone who has to be or who was to become one of my closest and dearest friends. While we were sitting at the Oval House cafeteria having lunch prior to performing the show, we were approached by a smartly dressed young guy who had a camera hanging around his neck and was cradling the lens in his left hand. He quietly and very politely introduced himself. Hello, my name is Peter Christofferson. I'm really interested in your show. Would you mind if I take some photographs tonight? There was something about the way he sidled up to us that was a bit creepy, but also made me smile and say, ooh, you're sleazy. (laughs) And so sleazy became his name. Yeah, end quote. (laughs) (laughs) All right, I'm switching back to screen. There we go. Yeah, but... Although, as you notice, even then, not that this is a big deal, but there's differences in what really happen. Like, CZ just introduces himself to Jen as at William Burroughs, but realistically, yeah, they were eating lunch, and which would make sense. They're eating lunch after the show and CZ would roll up a photographer and be like, hey, I'm interested in your show. You know, what's more likely? This, yeah. I mean, this one's not a big deal, but Jen is definitely a compulsive liar, and that's what they do. They'll not that I'm trying to diagnose people or something, but it's very obvious. They just, It's little things. Um, that was the big thing that started off in this memoir and grew and grew. I tried to ignore it because it was Jen where they would describe stuff and, like, everything always went their way. They were always the best at everything. Even, like, when, when they talk about the school, they were bullied, which, um, to their credit, it was very interesting reading about, like, everyone knows, especially because of Pink Floyd, like, how awful 
English schools were, especially boys' schools. You do get some of that with some good dry English humor from Jen, which I did enjoy. Talking, this is a very, you know, it talks very English. And this book about their school experiences, which is always an interesting read. But even then, you know, they had like a, they had like um, military classes and shooting practice. And, you know, Jen got high remark, high stuff, everything there, which it could be true, but it's just, it's one of the big issues. You just don't know what's real and what's reality with Jen. Um, even, I have to find it, because even in this, in the memoir, they say that they got a, they won a scholarship and they weren't paying for the school. That's how they got into it. But Cozy says, talking to um, their good friend Spidey, which actually there's a picture of her and one of Jen's school friends that they became friends with, Spidey. Here, they said that it's them who got the scholarship, and Jen actually was pay was a payer for school, which is completely the opposite of what Jen said. Well, yeah, and then I remember at some point Jen's parents being mad that he decided to be an artist, and I realized that was college, but it was something like all this hard work we did, you know, to get you where you are, and it's like. If you won a scholarship, were your parents doing anything? Like, yeah. I I don't know. Um, there's just, it's like you said, uh, even with the Spidey, you know, like, if I recall, there's very little mention of Spidey's interaction with Cozy, even though that was pretty prevalent. I mean, they got the photos. They were very good friends. Yeah, so it's, I don't know, it's so weird that... Um, that uh, this thing where there's definitive proof because Jen passed in what 2020, right? I believe so. Yeah. You want to say it was 2020? Um, Wait, it could. It might just say right here. Uh, yep, March 20, March 14, 2020. But it's just weird that you know Jen had time, and I realized they were struggling with ailments and stuff. But Jen had time to read and take in. Uh, what Cozy said and still chose to like mark her as like the scornful lover rather than as this collaborative partner because even though Jen was abusive towards Cozy she still showed that like yeah he was a driving force but at one point uh, he remarks like oh I had three girlfriends same time I had cozy and so when she started messing around with chris i was like okay and it's like who really cares like yeah and that's not um, how it, that's not how it goes down uh before throbbing gristles coom transmissions and this band of people wherever they lived um because of their income status and how they dressed and stuff they were deemed as like hippies and artists and back then in england you would get beat up a lot for that, especially by people like the skinheads and Hell's Angels. So mm -hmm. they had an issue with Hell's Angels harassing them. And then Jen talks about the story um, where one night they banged on the door and bothered them. Now Jen tells the story that they like hugged the leader of the Hell's Angels and just said like everything will be okay and they became friends. But then Cozy's book, it was her that's diffused the situation. Um... She says, my background meant I was more savvy at handling Hull hard cases than the others, who mainly had a, sh uh, who mainly had a sheltered middle class upbringing, i.e., Genesis. I was immediately confronted by one of the biker's girlfriends, a tough blonde girl they called Glob. She was smaller than me and was surprised at my combative response to her threats. I blanked her and entered into a dialogue. Then a couple of the guys, some of them came from Long Hill Estate and my family home. That commonality was our saving grace. We ended up having a half civil conversation with them, vocally sparring until we arrived at an amical kind of understanding and they eventually left. So it I, wasn't it wasn't Genesis hugging the leader of the Hells Angels groups coming in. It was that they it was cozy to see the situation because she gave her the same place as them and they were able to calm them down. If you um, wanna switch over, I, I I actually got it pulled up too. So if you'd like the uh here we go. Oh, yeah, maybe I should start doing that more. Oh, it's all good. I have to find it when you bring you it up. So, yeah, but yeah, so yeah. you can pause and read. So you know, it's just stuff like that. And even when you're reading the Jen account, you're like, 
is this reality? And actually on the page <laughs> next to it, it says, contrary to what others may have said, uh, the Hells Angels never had three day parties at the fun house, which is what they referred to where they lived at the time, the Ho-Ho Fun House. Um, they just popped around now and again. So, you know, more stuff they would just say, think of sound cool. Oh, the Hells Angels party at the Ho Ho Fun House, which, you know, Cozy wants to say that's not reality, which is a lot of stuff. <laughs> yeah, um, there, there were several parts where, um, like, it, it just conflicted with what would make sense. And I understand reality doesn't always make sense, <laughs> no, but, especially not. Um, eccentric individuals yeah and um i've so i've got a note here speaking of like you know jen being self-important and stuff i got a note about in non-binary page 144 uh it says doubtful of the whole psychiatrist thing Reminds me of Vallis by philip k dick and of a comment someone left on a video of jen saying They'll do anything to avoid getting a real job. Um, yes, yeah, oh shit, crazy. Well, I have to, you are unemployable and I'm going to write that. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's basically the psychiatrist just straight up bending to Jen's will. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I'm like, uh. um, But they do talk about, you know, oh, being on the dole was great. And I, I get it, like, you know, as an artist, you want more time for creativity and freedom yeah. and stuff. But this doesn't mention, like, all of Cozy's, you know, doing, like, Everything. photo shoots. and Yeah, photo shoots, photocopying, uh, the well, seamstress work, things like that. So. The only job Jen mentions is her first job, which was being a lab assistant to, like, a school to set up stuff. And... They say something like, what a boring job. They literally say that straight up, like, just very bypass. They don't, they downplay Cozy's work so much. And then in this book, not only is Cozy a multiple job, she's the only, like, main income for so many times. And, you know, she went back to school for secretarial work so she could get more money. So at one point, she's doing all this stuff for Coon, doing the sewing and helping down with the printing and doing stuff, packing stuff up, going to school, looking for photo shoots and working another job. She she did a job where she sewed boxer shorts at a factory, was going to school, doing Coon stuff, and then walking on eggshells with Jen. And she still had to do all the cooking and the cleaning. Oh, and yeah, because if I remember right, Jen said that's like women's work or something. Yeah, I have a line here. She says, and I was also pissed off that so-called radical thinkers and supporters of liberation like Jen, Greg, and the others couldn't see that they assumed my role as woman to be the washer, cook, and cleaner in addition to everything else I did with the coom. When it came to sharing domestic work, equality of the sexes seemed to escape them. It didn't matter whether I put in a full day's factory work or done a day at maths at college. Yeah, uh, I've got it pulled up to, but it's completely right. Like, um, yeah. as far like it's it's more believable to me as an outsider because these are people I love and admire, all four of them. You know, for all their flaws and everything, I can say I admire all of them. But the yeah. fact that Cozy has a coherent narrative that is so inclusive and so um i can't even call it detailed just well put together um speaks volumes to me as far as believability versus jen's you know it's what like 120 pages or so before they get to like any of their truly artistic stuff so, i know it feels like i don't know what the is the flow of this memoir but it feels like Nothing happens, which is weird because Cozy has plenty of times to go. She goes real depth in the Coom stuff. Like yeah. I said, I'm I'm almost at page 200, and they're not even at TG yet. You know, she does obviously talk about her own work, trying to find you know her getting into the pornography world and stuff. Um, 
but it's not like a slog and it she still interweaves it with fall her it's basically her day-to-day -day life trying to juggle she even said juggle coom juggle jen juggle working and do it she had a job and did the sex work uh, trying to build a portfolio you know and yeah. And they're going to different countries and doing stuff, and, you know. And she she still talks about like you know Jen and all the stuff he's doing too. She's not downplaying him or anything. She talks about all the yeah. stuff they did together. Um, I don't know. It's pretty ridiculous. There's like and obviously TG came around. A big thing Jen kept saying was that they did everything. That Chris and Sleazy and Cozy did nothing, um, which is literally the opposite of the case. Oh yeah, there's just I randomly turned to this line I saved. Like the way Jen talked about Cozy, just random throwaway line that had nothing to do with Cozy. You saw they were talking about Sleazy. Um, they say Cozy hadn't read any Burroughs or the Beats. She was a party girl, and then it just goes back to talking about Sleazy. Um, oh, first, okay. yeah. First of all, well, she does say in the book that Burroughs was an interest of hers, but even right now when she's talking about going to a uh, photo shoot, she brings a bunch of Aleister Crowley books to read to spend the time. She's highly intelligent. She won multiple awards in school, and the only reason she didn't go to school for science and chemistry and art is because her dad didn't allow her. Which, can you imagine if she did go to college, you might not have this, but still... Um, she was real, and the reason she stayed with Jed is because she was very much into magic and stuff, we believe, and she was into all that, you know, and esoteric stuff and all that, just because she didn't revert, like, yeah, and it's like, all right, party girl, like, you did copious amounts of fucking LSD too, and drug, everyone did, and she doesn't hide that, they talk about their drugs, you know, like, I don't want to fucking hear it, and it's like, out of nowhere, and it's hard for me to read this too, because of the stuff I've read, Posey's book, um, I am also a victim of a very abusive relationship. And the things she says and the way it plays out is exactly my experience it's with the gaslighting, the way stuff happens, the you made me do this, and it's just, it's ridiculous. Um, unacceptable. And like I said, I love TG. I don't know if I said this. I think Jen was a great front person for TG. I don't think it would have worked about them. I think they are talented, definitely. You know, the power they brought to that and all that, but they're just so egotistical. There's like another line where they say, um, nobody in Throbbing Gristle, like, oh, we don't understand the lyrics, so they didn't know what I was talking about. Then what the fuck is this, Jen? What is 20 Jazz Funk Greats by Drew Daniel? <sighs> oh, I love that book. Where he interviews every member of TG. And they talk about the lyrics and where the songs came from in this album. So don't fucking say in your memoir that they they said that, oh, we didn't even know what you were talking about. We didn't even know the lyrics. Like, what, fuck you. Then what is this? You know? And, what is, and, like, yeah, and adding to that, um, on page 226 in non-binary, Jen, you know, that that's what Jen's saying is, oh, they never listened. Um, and I've got a note written here. Cozy talked about in her book, she literally says only Jen could have been our front man because of his charisma and his lyrics. And so, you know, the fact that she can recognize that he's so unique and she even says like XTG was good, but it wasn't on mm. the same level as, you know, TG itself. Um, like that that just speaks volumes to like they knew what they were doing um and, and um hopping back to like jen being derogatory <laughs> to like jesus christ page 122 he says that uh when i stared at her with big big eyes the elastic in her panty snapped and they fell down but on in Cozy's book on page 50 and 51, I'm not going to bring it up. Uh, she doesn't mention that. And sh she, like, details that night pretty well because it was special for her, too. But and she brings for... up all kinds of stuff, even embarrassing stuff. So, And she would definitely have brought that up. She brought up other stuff about Jen, too, she thought was a single set. That was a weird thing. I don't know. Yeah, it, it, it just... 
um, you know, Jen's very much subscribing to the great man theory, uh, or great day theory. Um, because they, they even bring up like, oh, I found Billy Idol, page 188. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> I found Billy Idol and, and all, and, um. Well, I don't, they say that in the, their biography, they're, uh, all right, they mentioned Jen. So I can't con- confirm or disconfirm that maybe it is true but it's a big thing to say. but that's one of the things it's hard to say because what jen says is you know truth or not we can only have what other people can confirm i suppose which is not something you should have as your legacy um but yeah that was one of the main if you want to take anything from that this whole thing uh yeah jen's saying that the band these people that they were very intimate with um, so intimate that they all would like sleep with each other and be with each other 24 7 throbbing gristle and have in-depth discussions on magic and sex and lyrics and all stuff all of a sudden these people apparently had no idea about the lyrics or anything that jen was doing um you know even though they reunited and stay close and uh you know whatever the fuck this is them in-depth discussion 20 like the lyrics um of the album i don't know what the fuck this is then right right that's just crap fucking get rid of it you know, Jen, it, it's so fucking strange because throughout the book, um, I've got multiple notes where he's talking about, like, oh, I'm influenced directly by this style. And, like, he, he picks apart, like, uh, the croning of, um, oh, my God, who was it he was obsessing over? Frank Sinatra. He picks apart Frank Sinatra's croning, and he talks about um, his... Uh, learning of poetry and v- playing the violin. And so Jen had training and stuff, but then um, at several points, including on page 225, he's like, why learn any chords or, you know, like he plays up ignorance of uh, technique and stuff, but then yeah. comes right back full circle with all of it and says, you should also do the cut up technique because it's like the most powerful magical method, mm-hmm. which like this is all very you know contrarian in my head because what works for uh Jen and Burroughs might not necessarily work for like you and me and yeah. but Jen wants to put it forward as like this is the end all be all. And then come back and also say, just don't bother learning anything because traditions are bunk. But also I went to, where was it, Budapest or uh, Tibet? Tibet. Tibet, yeah. I, uh, but also I went to Tibet and you know lived in a Buddhist monastery. And that's where I got my guidance to go to America and flee the UK. I'm like, huh? There's a lot of contra- obviously there's a lot of contradictory ideas in, in this book. Um, one one that always sticks out to me about Jen specifically um, in doing the research for my White House video or the Come Org, um, listened to a lot of William Bennett interviews, and I love William Bennett. Um, yeah, he said some stupid stuff, but he's a very down to earth, nice guy, very interesting to listen to. Uh, but you know he is very passionate about being like, you know, very anti rock and roll and music and stuff. And he said that specifically Genesis, he loved early throbbing gristle, but he hit everything after because Genesis became obsessed with becoming the rock star, which was very not what TG was about or, and that's what they say. But even then this own book, they flip back and forth between like stardom wanting to like, like, Oh, I don't want to do like, I understand like, keep contradicting what people expect which is fine but like i don't want to do industrial underground something i would now i want to do like rock and like oh look how surprised they are that we're doing rock now or trying to be star like shut the fuck up jen you just want to be a cult leader rock star you want to be brian jones i don't know i so a long 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 time ago i read uh stardust a david bowie story and Mm. then um I've read the David Bowie is book that was at uh, his exhibition and um, like, I've read a lot about David Bowie and Jen comes off as like a less certain David Bowie because David Bowie and Jen both employed a lot of this similar as 
Jen calls them magical techniques or artistic rebirth techniques, you know, changing your name, changing uh, your style, switching things up. Uh, they, they both uh, were dating women that they started dressing the same, like getting the same outfits to dress the same and things like that. They both did a cut up too. Oh yeah. From Brian Geisen. Yeah. yeah. David Bowie also was very passionate about that. He actually, uh, I don't know if he wrote it or commissioned it or what, but he had a computer program that you could feed news articles into it from online and it would just automatically cut them up. Nice. And by typing, like just hitting shit on your keyboard, you would tell it to grab random section. But anyways, yeah. um, so Jen, Jen is coming off to me as a less certain David Bowie because at one point they feel like being commercially successful would uh, jeopardize the integrity of their artistic vision, which uh, at several different points, their artistic vision changes um even though they try to put it at the forefront as how do we short circuit control um versus david bowie's artistic vision if i remember correctly his was just continual evolution and exploration of the human spirit and he went through just as many genre changes except whereas jen claims like we we can give jen industrial we'll say jen created modern industrial we'll yeah. we'll give them that but where jen acid claims <laughs> yeah claims they invented acid house claims they invented this and that and the other thing it's like people in retrospect say david bowie was the definitive like glam rock or this or whatever and you know, he wasn't always the best and shit, but I, I just feel like looking at the two just opposed because they grew up, you know, very similarly. In fact, I think their career started around the same time, if I'm remembering the timeline correctly. Oh, uh, maybe. I'm not as well versed in Bowie, but that could that could make sense. But I, I'm just, you know, just to like break out of our industrial shell a little bit and not compare strictly Jen to what Cozy said or to what you know, Clack DVA, give them some love. Um, Noi Balton or <laughs> SDK who? were doing. <laughs> Literally who? Uh, <laughs> uh, but, but, you know, just to break out a little bit, it's just, it feels yeah. like, you know, in their own memoirs, Jen is uncertain with their vision and they shift through it and where they say you know reclaim control reclaim your own destiny and th and break control they also at several different points say oh someone told me to do this so i went and did this and it's like you know okay sure jen but then <laughs> the accounts from other people it's like oh no like they wanted to do this or we knew in advance you know like there's so much information left out. It's it, it yeah paints a whole new picture. So exactly. Well, I like to. There is some photos in this book too. If there's one thing I always enjoy, if there's one thing I think is very genuine about Jen that I enjoy was their love for Lady J and the whole Pandrogeny projects. I think. Um, that is undoubtedly, you know, their passion of art, but I think their passion for each other and everything they did together then was very real and true. There's some good pictures of Jen doing performance art, which I really like, some rare ones. You don't, I haven't seen too much of that. Um, they have a picture of their, their wedding, too, which uh, Jen doesn't bring up, too, which is interesting. Um, their wedding to Lady J, which is a good picture of them together, which they do look like each other. I like that. It's a good merging of the two. So probably the realest side of Jen you'll ever get in Tender Side. It's probably like the ballad of Genesis and Lady J. I would suggest that. It's not long. It's good. But And then it shows the picture. I think uh, Lady J dressed like, in, uh, like a motorcycle male outfit and Genesis dressed up in a wedding dress, which is very symbolic of pretty much their relationship. Um, because Lady J was very androgynous, which they were attracted to since the beginning. They both were. They wear each other's clothes. Their whole relationship is very interesting. That whole movie, like, that's... 
And I wanted more of that, and I wanted more, you know, of Jen's kids and family, but, you know, um, yeah. any person that didn't end well either. But, yeah, if you want to explore that side of Jen, which I think is worth exploring, like I said, I think it's the most genuine side of them, I would check that um, little documentary out. And I'm just surprised. I know they're sick, but they hardly go into depth for that part at all. I don't know. There's a lot of weird... Besides all the lying and posturing, there's a lot of weird just choices for information in this memoir. And, and that's, yeah, that's the thing is, like, they jump all the way back. Um, let's see. Did the choices, there's a checklist about the questions, Coom first, whatever. Um, yeah, so I think after... Lady J's death. So Jen lives for like another 12 years after this. Yeah. Uh, after Lady J's death. So, you know, that's heartbreaking and stuff. But they, they jump all the way back to the beginning of their life and of Coombe and everything and then start talking about Burroughs again and stuff. And uh, they try to give this like huge artistic thing, but like you said, like there's so much uh, within the Lady J and Genesis, the Briar P. Orridge uh, communion that like I spent like two or three years obsessed with it in like 2011, 2014, that, that time. And it, it's just like there's interviews, pictures. Hell, I found a brand new picture I never saw before today while uh, researching for this video. Like there's so much good material out there and it's a great point in Jen's life. And in my opinion, cause I don't really know anything about her outside of her relationship with Jen and lady J's life too. And Jen just glosses over it pretty yeah. much. Like I was really, I was really surprised. Um, yeah. Not but, sure. Maybe maybe it was just too painful for them to write about while they were, yeah. you know, very sick. That's my best guess, which, you know, I can't blame them if that's the case, but you know, they wanted to focus on the sex. A lot of sex. <laughs> Lots of sex. I, I was having the sex. The best and the most sex. <laughs> it's like, yeah. okay, so how did Jen actually pay for all those surgeries? Well, you see, I was having awesome sex with four women at once, and then Rick Rubin owed me six hundred thousand dollars. So, <laughs> Rick Rubin stuff kind of made me laugh. I'm gonna lie. Yeah, it was it was kind of weird. Um, I do want to give respect to Jen for not only recognizing was it David J or um, from Love and Rockets, now Bauhaus uh, or former yeah. Bauhaus, but he he recognized. Uh, his totem, which was that you know, like his first built guitar, and and saved it. Yeah, he jumped out the window with it and, and at great personal cost, mind you. So yeah, hopefully that's true. But I, I, mean... I, 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 I will say, and I know this is anecdotal, but I will say I've read elsewhere on the internet because everything on the internet's true. Yeah. Um, that it is so and i can believe rick rubin slay star which um which is a pretty awful thing that happened to jen they talk about you know they got really injured trying to escape a burning building due to faulty wiring and rick rubin's part and they got heavily injured say yes helping um people escape and saving like you know the guitar and stuff which made sense and it was really fast too, so it wasn't like a stupid idea. And it was just a, you know, it was just a shitty slip that they got really hurt, which, and they sued and won, thankfully. Yeah. But, you know, that was one of the shitty things that happened to Jen in this book that sucked. Yeah. And like we can recognize is like, you know, mm -hmm. as bad as Jen's been depicted in their own words and in other people's words elsewhere, like, you know, they they are still a human being, or they were still a human being, and so, like, breaking your fucking wrist, being caught in a fire, like, all that shit sucks. Um, 
I do hate how like the, so I had this dread as I was reading about, you know, like Jen's early childhood and shit, 100 pages in, mm. I had this dread that, oh yeah, you know, he's not really leaving a lot of room for, you know, <laughs> like in industrial music, like for throbbing gristle and for all the cool shit. And um, I was very let down when at the end of this book, like he mentions skinny puppy one time, he calls pig face a, Oh boy, I get to drink and get paid, you know, but, like, but even then, like Jen does the thing where like, Oh, I helped ogre get their conf his confidence back. Like I did this. So it's like, this posturing is so obnoxious. Like I did these amazing feats. Yeah, which Skinny uh, Puppy was having problems around that time for a lot of reasons. Yeah. And, and Jen could have given, like, if if they had wanted to give out more information, they could have. And, like, Ogre, both, you know, both the Kevins are still alive, so they could have com commented on it or something, like, Here's hoping we get a tell-all book from, you know, Skinny Puppy. Let's see. Stuff about Jen. <laughs> Jen had heavily criticized trans media, saying they espoused equality whilst effectively operating more as a hierarchy with Fitz as a leader. But it was a system Jen mirrored in Coom with himself as leader come mentor, but with the addition over time of an expanded agenda gleaned from Aleister Crawley's occultism and a touch of Charles Manson's cultism. He promoted with the Kuma notion that everyone has a genius factor. Jen's genius factor was not per art per se, but the art of manipulation, as myself and others came to believe. And then another... Uh, let's see. There's a line... Two. I maybe should have said this line earlier. That within Cozy's friends, too... Um, Cozy has this line, I got the sense how other people perceive Jen, because it's again, throughout the memoir, it seems like everybody loves Jen, no one had any problem, except Throbbing Bristle and Cozy and all of them had a problem with Jen. Um, and then, in Cozy's book, it says, I got the sense that Jen had finally overstayed his welcome with many of his upper and middle class peers. There was a noticeable shift away from them, most evident in their absence from our lives, save for Tim. Initially, Jen's antics and temper were accepted to some degree by my friends, but overall, they didn't warm to him. I thought maybe it's because he was eccentric. He thought of himself as a misunderstood artist, and so did I. My friends' opinions were more down to earth. Some found it pretentious, which made him distrust us, as Buddy discovered after he left Prince Street. He told me a lot of people I got to know didn't like Jen. I was surprised when I started socializing them, but there was such dislike for him. He seemed to upset a lot of people. <laughs> Yeah, um, it it's kind of weird because uh, I feel like maybe Jen just happened to find all these people that were in some way ostracized. And yeah. so it, this is totally uh, un, like, unclinical diagnoses, but like everyone in the more mainstream society or middle to upper classes saw Jen as a manipulator. And so Jen found all these ostracized people and started to collect them kind of like, um, uh, Jim Jones, because Jen at one point in, uh, the RE search, uh, issue six, seven, the industrial culture handbook even talks about like, yeah, I obsessed over, you know, cult leaders and, like, how to yeah. interact with people and get them to do different things and shit like that. And, um, oh, yeah. So, so, you know, if you're, like, learning about these practices and stuff, I don't think it's far-fetched to, you know, put them into practice. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, well, um, everybody... Microcosm. So. Well, it's very obvious they had that charismatic talking edge, people like talking to them. I mean, obviously, like, they got cozy to move it, which, in Jen's memoir, 
they claim that Cozy just showed up because their dad kicked them out and lived with them, and they were like, oh, I didn't really want that, but Cozy was uncertain and unsure, and they had kept joking that, or, like, mentioning that they eventually she was just going to move in with them, and that Jen was in love with her at the time, and wrote her letters, so I don't want to hear it, Jen, she just moved in. I'm trying to find, because I really just want to discuss that, I'm trying to find the part where he talks about, or they talk about, um, like, Cozy leaving, or where, oh, Cozy just wanted to leave, and I said, oh, okay. Yeah, oh, okay. Uh, yeah, that's that's totally what people say, Jen, when their partner leaves. Uh, so, a few more things I want to mention. Well, I want to mention the cringy stuff. We'll get there. I want to. Do, I have at least mentioned the really pot. We have to really mention the poster. I ha We can't not mention the Ian shit and all that. But I want to bring. Oh, oh yeah, Ian Curtis stuff. Okay. I can't. Uh, where the fuck is it? I need to find the. Uh, Oh, I found that line, yeah, about Throbbing Gristle being like, I remember doing an interview, this is in Jen's book, and this is what they say about the other members, I remember doing an interview when we reformed, and the journalist asked about the lyrics, and immediately Chris and Cozy went, we were never listening to the lyrics, we don't know what Jen's singing about, and I thought, God, how disappointing, and I wonder if it was true, had they really not cared, is that why I could get away with everything that I did, maybe it was true, and if so, what a pity. Yeah, okay, Jen. Uh, yeah, this just doesn't exist. None of this... None of this exists. exists. Yeah. I, it, what, I, yeah, what a shit show. Yeah, and then um, the way Jen talks about, like... Oh, I found it. Yeah. Oh, I was going to say, on page, yeah. like, 234 on through the way uh, he's, he talks about... Um, his relationship with Ian Curtis and like, oh, we're both scorned, you know, lead singers and we're going to form our own Frank Sinatra tribute band and all that. It, it's just, I don't know. It, it's so strange because I, I once asked a friend and like, wouldn't it be awesome? Because Jen had said in an interview somewhere that, he kept recordings of Ian Curtis's phone calls. And so there's a version of weeping out there recorded off of a phone of that's sung by Ian Curtis. And I'm like, wouldn't that be awesome if we got that, like as fans of joy division of Genesis P Orage and shit. And my friend was like, I don't know. I feel like that would be exploitative and then reading this, I'm just like, this feels a little bit exploitative. <laughs> like, well, it would be cool if it was real. Uh, someone, I didn't look into this, but I think I read this somewhere else once. I had brought up, because I had brought up the Ian Curtis page, and someone left a comment about, uh, hold on. Oh. Someone I follow that knows their stuff pretty well says, Jen also claims Ian was going to join the Temple Psychic Youth and that they tried to call Ian on the night they died. Years later, Peter Hook was asked if that was true, and they said there's no way it was true because Ian didn't own a phone. Which I've heard that elsewhere, too, because uh, anytime he needed to make a call, and I think they cemented this in... Um, not 20 yeah 24 hour party people and then what was the joy division movie uh there was another one or was i might be conf confusing joy division movies but there's several movies where you know it's based off fact and of course there's a dramatization but in uh like all three of them or whatever they 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 show ian walking to like a payphone or walking to someone's house to make phone calls and so either this is a giant conspiracy to, you know, paint Genesis Peorage as a liar about the phone calls with Ian Curtis or Ian Curtis just, was just not able, yeah, yeah, able to fucking receive phone calls because he didn't have a fucking phone. So, uh, I don't know. Like, there, there's a lot of... Um, there's a lot of things that you got to apply Occam's razor to. And I, I feel like Ian Curtis not having a phone is one of them. Um, 
maybe Jen yeah. just like as a lost friend is like, yeah, I wish I could have reached out to him, you know? I first heard the story with the Nardwar Psyche TV interview. Whoa, 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 whoa. In there. I'm sorry. Did you just say Nardwar Psychic TV interview? Yeah. Oh, my God. How did... <laughs> well, I only discovered Nardwar, um, like, two years ago. So, yeah, I, I didn't even know about this. Like, Yeah. Oh shit. Yeah, this is from 2016, too. Oh, and okay. They, and they tell the same story. And I remember reading the comments that people say the same thing. That they're like, oh, I don't know about that. Or that the Jen name drops people all the time. They love name dropping. Yeah, uh, that's something that got very annoying uh, throughout Real this bad. book. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's just, oh, by the way, you know, I was here with so-and-so. And it's like, okay, Jen, you know, <laughs> like, I don't care. Like, tell me more about like how you think about this thing or, you know, just like give me something substantial or interesting versus by the way, Kevin key once ate a biscuit off of my butt or, you know, whatever it's <laughs> like, huh? So that didn't happen. Jen never said that. I'm just giving an example of shit. I don't care about, um, which, yeah, that's, that's what this book felt like is it's mildly interesting, but it's ultimately not very insightful and it's kind of regrettable. Like Sleazy's last words are forever held back behind fireworks going off. Like uh, maybe some better, um, you know, producer than I can strip the audio file and get rid of the noise so we can find out what Sleazy's last message was. I know, it's uh, like lost in translation. It's like, what is Sleazy saying? Yeah, like, he's like... Of end fireworks. I like to imagine maybe it's <sighs> something about Jeff. Maybe he'll see Jeff again. That's, that's my headcanon. Sleazy's last words are forever, or at least until technology gets better, locked away behind a wall of noise, which is kind of ironic um eventually that'll be overcome so it's really great it was captured and i'm gonna go over it as soon as we're done off this because it was part of he was putting out videos called like sleazy tv or whatever yeah. <laughs> and so this was the last video uploaded yeah. like three days before he died and he says something like for now this is uncle sleazy signing off yeah and then he says something and that's it I, it's it's very haunting, but that that's what I'm getting at is yeah. <laughs> his last words are now like under maybe no design of his own cryptic and locked behind and shrouded in mystery and are potentially like very insightful, uh, just like the rest of his body of work versus I feel like this is it, like if I wasn't such a fucking throbbing gristle fanboy and i do have yeah. a psychic cross tattoo i feel like this would be damaging to the legacy jen left behind it, it's i yeah it was kind of hard i don't want to say it's like borderline but getting through this was rough yeah. um but then tg is just so you have to remember too it's not jen's just hit their project like they try to claim it's not just jen or throbbing gristle jen in the throbbing gristles it's Chris Carter. It hits a lot of Chris Carter. We're not even going to get into that whole shtick. Um, yeah. Sleazy and co it's a lot of cozy. And it's pretty fucking obvious when you listen to Chris and Cozy and, you know, Coil. They're pretty good, I guess. <laughs> they might be good. I don't know. What's this <laughs> band called? Coil? Like the, you know, Coil Around a Bulb or something? I don't, I don't know. They have, no. It's not like, you know what I mean? But yeah, yeah. And it's just, you know, it's all of the, and, and then I, as soon as I immediately started reading this, and I, you love the progress again, this, come back to this, like, if you feel very deterred by reading this, which you could possibly, if this, like, this could possibly be damaging to someone new to them, but as soon as you read this, it's warm and comforting, nice work, you she actually writes Sleazy and Chris and Jen and herself and all these people as real fucking people and voices yeah. and stuff. Like, you feel like... That's the thing, too. Like, this doesn't even feel like a novel or anything. It just feels so bare bone. Yeah, like a Wikipedia article. It doesn't even feel like Jen's writing it. I don't know. 
what's going on with this? Well, you feel like you're there. You're long for the ride. You feel like you're here. <laughs> you really feel like you know these people. Like you're sad when uh, her friend Les goes to jail and comes back. And there's actually a photo of them reuniting. You're, you're worried for them. Well, I mean, even like yeah. even, even in this, like, I mean, look, look, you know, that's a fucking picture of Jen with who is this? Caress, you know, Caress, yeah. it's, it's like immediately you're brought into their world. And the whole article, Jen is interrupting the interviewer to expound on things and give their thoughts. And they're like positive towards not just sleazy, but Chris and Cozy. And it's this whole through line of like, it, it's so short, but it's this through line of information and knowledge and shit. And uh, at the end, they give like, what's in my library? What tapes am I listening to? You know, things like that. And yeah. so, you know, in non-binary, you're going to learn that Jen had an obsession with Frank Sinatra and that... Um, they knew like poetic forms and they had a little bit of training as far as being a lyricist and that they kind of taught themselves violin. Like they had musical background despite what they said. Um, but in almost anything else, in almost any other interview, any other book, essay, whatever, you're going to get, way more particular or in-depth information of whatever period of life of Jen's that it's covering. And I, I'm, I kept thinking like throughout non-binary, I kept thinking about that scene in decoder where Jen is playing a cult leader because of course, yeah. um, which, you know, by the way, dear viewer, if you have not seen Decoder, uh, you need to go see it. Um, it's not like I might. Some awesome person, not me, me, has a video about it, all about it. Uh, which I think uh, you might want. Decoder is a movie that would help with a little bit of context, especially if you don't fully understand industry and all that. So maybe you could watch my, just watch my damn video and then you can watch Decoder. Do it. <laughs> Do sure, it. Just do it. But yes, uh, yes. Um, and it, you know that's the present. That's the presence Jen had though. Was like the way they are in that scene is how a lot of people viewed them. You know, and you just don't, you just don't get that from this at all. Yeah, and, and in that <laughs> scene though, uh, Jen tells the main character. Uh, he at the time, like he was definitively a man. He goes okay, we'll give you a little information, you know, and, and like, it, it's such a banal line, but it's delivered in this yeah. strange, off-kilter way that you feel like you've just been inducted into something, and I thought about that throughout all of this, like, I'm being give, drip-fed shit. Oh, yeah, that's true. Versus, like, throughout their history, anytime I've encountered Jen, like, um, on the Topi Network, like, there was a psychic uh, psychic network or whatever. Like, they, they tried making the Temple of Psychic Youth again in, around, like, 2010. And I joined it, and I, every time Jen posted on there... I felt like I was getting new information. I was being reached out to. And I even asked Jen, like, very simply, if I could use the psychic cross for, at the time, like, an art project I was doing. And they gave me this whole fucking, like, three-page essay about, you know, basically what the psychic cross is, what it means. And it was just so informative. And I was like, okay, so is that a no? And they're like... <laughs> no, I'm saying you may use the psychic cross. And I was like, but, but that, that was so characteristic of like every time I encountered Jen in some yeah. form, I was getting more information. I was learning more. And now it just, it felt like there was nothing coming from this. It felt like you said, very bare bones, very stripped down, very like uninteresting pretty much. I, I'm wondering I have to wonder, it, like, obviously, 
Jen wrote this and they're ill. Is it just illness? Did they even write this? Were they telling someone what to transcribe? Maybe talking? Because what you said is true. Um, there are parts that are very verbose and passionate and the stuff that Jen cares about, but other stuff, I don't know. It's hard to say. Um, like, even the title I think we talked about before we started streaming. I, the title non-binary, Jen has never, maybe the literal technical definition of non-binary, like, being, like, not anything at all, but on any spectrum, but they wanted to do away with gender and everything in general, but that's not a term that Jen probably would have used. I wanted, I like conspiracy that that's not the actual title that this memoir should be. I think whoever put this together, because this is a post-mortem memoir, just chose that to sell it. Um, if I had to guess, they probably wanted like Pandrogyny or something to be the title. Something other than non-binary. I just can't imagine that would be the title they chosen. That's just my thing. I could be completely wrong, but I... I don't know. It's just. I mean, I also, I, I want to lend support to that theory because, um, like, in my obsession with uh, the, you know, Pandrogen project, uh, well, the Pandrogen as a creature, as a concept, whatever you want to refer to it as, um, yeah. Briar P. Orridge, it like. <laughs> They weren't. They weren't trying to be non-binary. They were trying to do away with it altogether. And so, yeah. For for this book to be titled that now, I felt like it was, uh, you know, like a moment too late. You know, like maybe yeah. five years ago, that would have been like a very strong and impassioned title, and maybe Jen could have came around. But uh, being part of Psychic Trash Void and being obsessed oh yeah shout out to psychic trash boy on um, shout out the simple flips no. <laughs> um but i just i never i never felt like the modern terms of non-binary and gender fluid and stuff really were part of jen's lexicon no or... and, and jen says they hate the term gender fluid they say that yeah. right in the book they don't yeah. like that term like that's in this book called non-binary. Yeah. Uh, so that that's I agree. It it feels like it was maybe done to try and grab some appeal, and there were some people that were, you know, like wrote a couple lines about the title or what have you. But this book was gonna sell no matter what. It's Genesis Peorge's memoirs. Um, I mean, we both have fucking copies. I pre-ordered mine. I think you did too. No, so. I bought mine at a um, this place, Misinformation Cafe, which is kind of a, uh, which uh, is this place in Colorado because I just went on a big, huge road trip. But I've been meaning to pick it up. But every I did see this. We stopped at a lot of bookstores. I saw this book, so, this book around. But unlike a lot of book, this book wasn't being sold a lot as like a music book or anything is mostly sold as an LGBT because this was in June too I think we can this was mostly being sold as an LGBT memoir which it is but um that's that was like what people are forcing on it and as its selling point I think with the title I think that's what they were trying to do maybe Jen's a stick I mean more money to them because it probably has sold because I mean you know if you're you know a, a young you know, queer person, you see that this is selling, like, some, you know, person non-binary, very interesting, a musician, you, like, you want to, like, that's appealing, that's very interesting, like, what is this, what? I mean, Pandrogy would be a way better title. Yeah, Pandra, yeah. Like, what the fuck? like, and, I don't know, I feel like, I just, I don't like this title for Jen's work, I don't know if they would, too, that's my issue, I don't know what Jen would say, but, who knows, I don't, I can't say. No one knows anything about what Jen would want. <laughs> um, I'm actually friends with someone. I cannot remember their name off the top of my head, but I am friends with someone that spent a lot of time with Jen uh, the last, like, five or six years of their life. And back in, like, 2010, they uh, it's the person that created Psychic Trash Void. Um, why their name's escaping me, I don't know. No one, like, the you know, hunt me down. But anyways, <laughs> like they they were, you know, very close to Jen and they helped Jen out a lot. And 
Um, they were one of the big proponents of like the the GoFundMe that David Rushkoff talks about at the uh, afterward of the book and everything, and um, even helping put together the uh, tribute to Genesis Peorage uh, compilation um, that was on Bandcamp, where proceeds went to Gen. It's like you know, it's like there are people there, and yeah, I feel inclined again as third party to say that they would agree with you that non-binary isn't like a very good title for this book. And mm-hmm. I, I feel like you're saying from what you saw, this was being marketed as an LGBT book. Um, I feel like that's even worse, even more damaging. Yeah. And it really, it really was being advertised like everywhere it went. Even when I bought it from where I did, I think even the sticker might, no, the sticker doesn't have it, but I saw it in a lot, which is fine. I mean, I don't think it's, the war I could see like why they put it there. They can put it in that section, but that's how it was advertised as a little different. I feel like um I can't speak for lesbians, but I can speak for bisexual and I guess gay men uh, and I'm speaking as a bisexual man. Um, I'm just ace. <laughs> hey, you're part of the alphabet gang too. Don't worry. Um uh, <laughs> Uh, but, uh, yeah, I feel like a lot of them have an attraction to industrial, to uh, noise and stuff. And so maybe, you know, like maybe like 1% of the overall, you know, gay and bisexual men know who Jen is yeah. or care. And so it's probably more than that. Let's be real. Yeah. But yeah, but I know what you mean. <laughs> So yeah, maybe it, maybe it was a marketing thing. Um, I don't feel I like it, it was is. a very good marketing yeah. thing. Yeah, I think it's marketing. <laughs> I think it's like guys. Yeah, um, definitely definitely not the smartest marketing choice in my opinion. Um, no. But what do I know? I just yeah. <laughs> just been up. listening to the music for like fifteen for you know for fifteen plus years. So. Me too. <laughs> Listen, remember that the tweet, um, it's like, you, you don't love noise, you have gender dysphoria. <laughs> don't bring that up, please. <laughs> you don't really Let, love noise music. <laughs> that, that, that tweet lives in my mind rent-free. Same. Like, probably, probably, um, I'll, I'll go ahead and say probably 60 to 70% of the noise artists I know within the community, um, are trans or non-binary. So, yeah, I mean, even my own discord, which we all interact in, um, hi, hi guys. Yeah. You're all here. (laughs) We're a very motley crew of all kinds of outcasts of people and walks of life. And so. love you all. So. Exactly. Yes. We can all be cringe together. We'll see me. No. So I feel like um, people might not like this, but I feel like I, ha- I have to bring up some of the stuff Jen did. So I can't just take Jen talking the way he talks about Cozy and the way he talks about things in the past. I, if anything, I really have to bring up. So, um, so yes, Cozy in Genesis. Uh, before Cozy is a Chris Carter, she was with Jen at the beginning of Coom Transmissions, way before TG and before all this. Um, and then they broke up, and she ended up with Chris Carter, and Jen got married to Paula, Pauline. I'm having a brain fart. Uh, Paula. Yeah. Yeah. Which that's a whole nother spiel. Um, <laughs> Just burn through marriages in this book. But, yeah, anyways. Uh, but, now, you have to remember, too, Cozy's book came out many years before this memoir, and this was, like, the information we had on Throggers. And we still do. This is the true blue stuff. Um, a lot of people's opinions changed of Jen, too. So a lot of people just didn't know that about Jen. You read this. And then, I hate to, like, say it, too. I hate people say this, but you read it, and you're like, I'm not surprised. It makes It, like, makes complete sense, but... Jen was a very abusive partner and would blame, he would say um, it was their illness or they did very, very typical gaslighting and physical and mental abuse. 
Uh, and then finally, Cozy was able to escape. And But Jen sees their relationship break. So I'm going to read the part in Jen's memoir of them breaking up. And then I'm going to read Cozy's. Um, also, another big thing that Jen did not bring up at all was that uh, they did um, get Cozy pregnant. Okay, let me... So let's start. So I wanted to start all this. I just wanted to bring this context as Jen never brought this up. This is kind of a big deal. Um, the trauma of the shoplifting arrest was eclipsed by something far worse just a few months later when I discovered I was pregnant with Jen's child. Jen hated and refused to wear condoms, which I just want to bring up is fucking awful and a really shitty, abusive thing. Um... And I foolishly went along with it. I was 18 with a meager means of support, and I couldn't go back home, pregnant or not. I'd known Jen for less than six months, and neither of us expected me to get pregnant or wanted a child yet. I was thrust into the whirlwind of emotions. Um, and then, uh, it's a big, long passage, but they do decide to get an abortion. And it's a big emotional trauma for Cozy. Um, to Jen's credit, she does write that he was, when she came back from the abortion, that they were comforting her and was there for her, which is good. But there, there's just a lot. There is a lot of turmoil in it. There's so like we could be here all day if I just brought up passages that she wrote in her diary of just all the nasty shit Jen did. If I could find it, there's like there's a part where she's making breakfast and they get arguing about something simple, which is every time we got in a fight too, it was like I was trying to fucking cook. That's what they love to get fucking uppity. I don't know what it is. You're trying to do stuff. And like he threw the pan out the window. She's like, she laughs. Cause I mean, she felt awkward. It was kind of funny. And then he like took his medicine out and like threw it out the window too. So oh. he's going to kill us all like a big fucking baby. Like, yeah. Like I'm going to die now because of you. And I probably did that too. Like, oh, I'm gonna kill myself, but it's your fault. You're doing like, it's, you know. And then yeah. she, got, and then she, you know, you feel scared. She would run down all the way to go get it, and then just shit like that. Or they got like, um, she turned off a boiling pot of water that they were boiling, and they got all pissy. Like broke the typewriter and smashed it and blamed it on her that she made him do that when they were there, and like. And then it just, you can see it escalating, too, through um, her diary entries. Um, he just straight up started, like, kick, like, punching her. Yeah. Like, um, not even, not even, like, in a way that can be misconstrued as, like, a playful sex thing. Mm -hmm. it's, it's just straight up, like, I have animosity to you as a human being, you know? <laughs> 25th of May, 1977. I told Jen it had upset me, etc., um... And I believe that upsetting was him just seeing uh, Sue, the woman Sue, just straight up sleeping with her and not telling Cozy. And it ended up in him punching me like a punching bag. I thought I had a black guy, but I never don't think I deserve that. Um, and just a little bit after, it says, as you, like, you know, going off the same page as usual, he hit me when no one else was present and never said sorry, just... Look what you made me do, leaving me the one in the wrong who should apologize and him the victim. Yep. 5th of January, 1975. What a day. Jen had a terrible flare-up. He smashed one of the dinner plates and then grabbed one of his drawings from the wall. When I tried to take it from him, he smashed it over his knee. I held him and we were both shouting. Me saying, that's enough. And him saying, no, it isn't. And I, start, I started it by going on about him not turning off the kettle when it boiled. And, um, ooh, so I have to bring this up, too, just for, because, um, he likes to abuse the animals, too. They had cats, and, which Jen also really glossed over, was Tremble was a big part of life. Um, oh, yeah. They got, they, for Valentine's Day, Jen got, or allowed Cozy to go pick a puppy from a kennel, and they got a little runt that was scared, and that's why they called them tremble it was a big part of the life and the two cats that they the mom cat brought to their apartment they rescued um but there are stories of uh cozy having to like bring the animals to the vet and here's one i think it's fair to say 
that Jen wasn't as fond of animals as I was, and to some extent I can understand why, with his borderline cat allergy, particularly as Mooney would sometimes shit in Jen's shoes instead of using the cat litter tray. One day, Mooney did it again, and Jen snapped. He grabbed Mooney by the scruff of his neck and threw him out the bedroom door. Such force, he went flying across the landing and down the stairs. I shot after him. He landed on the second flight down, where he lay silent still. I thought he was dead, and Jenny picked him up. He stirred a little, so I grabbed my coat and put him inside against my chest to keep him warm and safe and ran off to the Blue Cross vet. Uh, Mooney was thankfully okay. Not long after, Jen had another cat throwing episode where he looked after my sister's kitten. So. Yeah, good guy, or good person, Jen. Yeah, and so. I... Uh, and, and highlighting, you know, like the abuse towards animals and stuff, I want to point out that in non-binary, Jen doesn't mention these animals at all. Um, they mentioned then, tribal like once or twice, but just like in like context of possessions and stuff they had okay. to pack up. But they do go ahead and highlight that as they were leaving a building, it was brink, it was on the brink of collapsing. And so they booby trapped it so that if you open the main door, it would collapse the building on top of you. And I understand they were like doing it as like an anti authoritarian thing, but it's like, I'm pretty sure some other squatters moved in after you. So Especially maybe, back then. yeah, maybe not the nicest thing you could have done, Jen. Like, we can't say anything happened because there's no definitive proof other than Jen's book, but I just wanted to point out that of all the things they left out, they decided to include, I potentially killed people in it. Yeah. It's like, why, Jen? Why do you make it so hard to love you? <laughs> like, I know. But I'm bringing this up because, like I said, I wanted to compare uh, what Jen says about the relationship breaking up to Cozy. So here's where the passage is about the breakup for um, on, in bi non-binary Jen's side of the story. Um, and like I said, this isn't really he said, she said thing because Cozy's is from her journal and col colla collaborated or cooperated. I forgot the term. It's corroborated, yeah. It, it's verified by other people who were there and, and know. Um, also, right before they talk about the breakup, they have this like little just this little line that really pissed me off about Cozy. Um, so, later when we did the cover photos for 20 Jazz Funk Greats, it was Cozy who suggested renting a Range Rover so it looked as if we had lots of money. And I always thought that was a little bit odd, but the idea of a Range Rover was funny, because it literally is. It's the, whole, the whole thing TG was doing was parodying, like, there's, there's a lot involved to that cover, even in this yeah. book, so you should check it out. And it was kind of a mutual decision for that car, which is pretty fucking hilarious that they rented and did that. Um, originally, <clears throat> excuse me, originally Range Rovers were something the royal family had, and Margaret Thatcher's son repped them to rich people until he was busted for cor corruption in Africa. So it was seen as a symbol of upper class power and wealth in Britain at the time. And then he, they just have to throw this line in, and I just, ugh. I always got the feeling that Cozy was thinking, I wish I had a Range Rover. And they italicized the I wish I had a Range Rover. And then right yeah. after, it just says, I never wanted a Range Rover. Like, it's, I can't even, it just says its own line. It's just so, it's, there's just a lot. It, <laughs> like, yeah, that's, that's the, that's the is, horrible yeah. thing is that, you know, they're saying, oh, I never wanted that. But then, um, their last series of pictures around like, well, not last series, but there were a series of pictures around like 2010 that it was Jen in bling. Like they had a gold grill. Yeah. You, you know these pictures. I yeah. Pictures. I try but, not to. So the people that are going to read this, it's, that's basically going to be the two camps is either people that so self-identify with Jen that, oh, I am the great man. Oh, I will do amazing things. And other people around me are, like, horrible. Um, 
they're going to like hold this book in high esteem and think we're just blowing shit out our ass um, versus the other group. Uh, they're going to be like, oh, it's kind of cringe from the get go, you know, <laughs> like, yeah, oh, it is. And I came with open mind, but it slowly builds up. Like everything is just so like awesome and perfect and then can do no wrong or they're so cool. I don't know. Yeah. Anyway, yeah, so there's that paragraph right before the breakup, um, which is this tiny little section in the book, which I understand, but more than, like, half this book is dedicated to their relationship and all the stuff going on in it. Um, and it says, right after the I never wanted a Range Rover, it starts, I knew she was seeing Chris because we're all together, and that didn't bother me at all. It was just par for the course. I was seeing So Catwoman and was having an affair with a Japanese journalist named Akio Hada. And then I had Kim Norris on top of that. I had three girlfriends who were really fun and everything was fine. Then Cozy finally said, I think I don't, I think I don't want to live here anymore. I don't think I'm in love with you anymore. I think I want to move out and be with Chris. And then, oh, okay, Jen says. Then we talked a little bit and she said, I'm going to go away on my own for about two weeks and I'll try and decide who I want to be with. Oh, okay, okay. Off she went, every day or two I'd get a postcard. It would say things like, my darling Jen, I miss you so much, or I'm so lonely, all this lovey-dovey stuff. Those came about every three days. Then she came back and asked, I'm going to live with Chris. Ah, okay. Like, that's like what they write, just like, oh, okay, ah, okay. It's these little lines. Yeah, um, I've I got I, it opened up, too. Uh, I, as soon as you read the first word of the first section, I was like, oh, I know what this is. So. Uh, I cried a bit because I felt I'd fucked up the coom thing. And, of course, I was attached to her. I did love her. Somehow, within a day or so of that, however, I found out that Chris had gone with her on the trip. So the whole time she was writing this bogus postcard, she was with Chris. I thought, why didn't you tell me? Why did she have to keep lying and make up the deception? I don't know what the fuck, like... Jen's even talking about here with this trip and postcards. I don't know where this happened. Especially after I'd already said, okay, ultimately Cozy wanted the car, the stability, a family, something much more domestic. There was no stability in my vision. That definitely bothered her. I remember clearly a point when Cozy told me probably one of the truest things she ever said. Sometimes I feel like I'm just dissolving in you. The intensity of what you are. I'm just vanishing into it. I'm drowning in it. Yeah, that's not a good thing, Jen. Anyway, larger than life... <laughs> And then Jen writes this, this is not me, larger than life Genesis just sucked her in and she didn't want to be a puppet anymore. She couldn't deal with it, didn't want to, which is fine. That wasn't what I was asking, but that's how it felt to her. She made the right decision to go. I just wish she had been more honest. That was it, and it broke in 1978. So, so that was Jen's of the breakup, and this is Cozy's <clears throat> chapter four. Despite my efforts, including being amenable to Jen, going to Poland for two weeks to stay with another girlfriend, he still seemed miserable most of the time. I was constantly having to second-guess his mood swings and try to heed them off by coming home with a box of monsters and an aerial chocolate bar. Nothing I did for him was enough. He showed no empathy towards me. It was always about him. If I had an early start for a photo or a film shoot, he'd keep me up late talking about himself, saying he was depressed and needing reassurance about his art, stroking his ego. He fed off me like a parasite, draining me psychically, physically, and emotionally. My love for Chris was so intense, and I knew my life with Jenny couldn't continue. I just had to be careful about the timing of my leaving him. In the end, it was determined largely by someone else. Chris's job for ABC News came to an end. He'd finished their new studio and was part of a team, so well, I mean, probably so she found she finds a new place. Um and she says, I couldn't leave Tremble behind. I I can't find the quote, but Jen also has like kicked Tremble too, their little like dog who already had issues with like people, and that's why they called him Tremble. Um so, on the 1st of August, 1978, we, as we lay in bed, I told Jen I thought that we should separate. I knew once I uttered those words, I would be inviting Armageddon, and sure as hell, it arrived. So, it wasn't just like, oh, okay. It wasn't Cozy stuttering, being like, I, th I think I should go, as Jen puts it. First, there were tears from us both. I held him close. I hated making and seeing him so sad. I know this shit right here, too. This is very real. 
when he realized he couldn't talk me around, that I wasn't just saying it to get attention and bring a relationship back on track, that really hit home and shook him to the core. But you're my battery. I feed off you, he said. No mention Jesus of love, Christ. just the vampire nature of his need for me. That's why I have to leave, I said. I feel like I'm being eaten away. He leaped on top of me, grabbed me by the throat, and started strangling me. If I can't have you, nobody can. Such a cliche, unbelievable, but true. I was strong enough to get him off of me and hold him down until his temper subsided a bit. He looked wild-eyed and crazy, and I suspected that as soon as I let go of him, he'd flip again. I jumped up, ran through the front bedroom, and dressed as quickly as I could, and grabbed my bag of essentials that I thankfully packed ages ago after the Sioux saga. Which, FYI, if you're in a bad situation like this, I did this too. You, you want It's really, because this can happen, to keep a bag of essentials hidden somewhere, just able to just fucking yank it, throw it down the stairs, get right out of there, all your important documents. Because this is very real. I heard Jen get out of the bed and turned as he came running at me, threatening to hurt Tremble as she stood there, tail between her legs and ears back, trembling and wondering what the hell was going on. Then he attacked me. He was so fast, all because of that. He screamed at me as he kicked me so hard in my crotch that it almost lifted me off the ground. I was doubled over in pain, holding myself. I couldn't move. Then he unleashed a torrent of punches and kicks and delivered a verbal blow that hurt me more. I'd never have let you kill my baby if I'd known you'd leave me. I was stunned. My baby, not our. How savagely cruel to use the child I mourned against me. Why would he think that keeping the baby would have ensured his hold on me? So many thoughts flowed through my mind. Much as I was capable of defending myself... I couldn't bring myself to hit him back, hurt him more than he was hurting already. I put his exceptional reaction down to him not knowing how to handle rejection, which is also a pretty real emotion. That is something to think about. I started moving my things out two weeks later on August 15th. I got busy to stay with Jen and keep an eye on him as I was worried about him. As I went to put Tremble in the, my mini with my final load of belongings, Jen demanded to come with me. I said no, and the drama began. He started kicking and thumping the car and screaming at me. He was like a madman. I put the car into drive. It was automatic, frantically trying to get away. Then he jumped in front of it and lay down on the road to stop me driving away. I leaped out to get him out of the way, not thinking the car was still in drive. It rolled onto him. I quickly pushed the gear stick into neutral and pulled Jen out of the way. You'd even drive over me to get away, he said. No, it was an accident, I explained. The car is automatic and I left in drive. He didn't believe me. Right, he shouted, and rushed into the house. Busy stood in the door with tears in his eyes. Go quick, he said. Good luck. All I could say was, sorry, I have to do this. I have to go. Then Fizzy was pushed aside as Jen came flying through the door, wielding a nine-inch knife of kill burned into the wooden handle, blazing, staring eyes, screaming and heading for me. Fizzy grabbed hold of him, took the knife, and dropped on the floor of the car so Jen couldn't snatch it back. Go, go, he shouted. I drove off at breakneck speed down Beck Road, turning on to Mayor Street so fast I lost two hubcaps as I scraped the curb. I wasn't going to stop. Uh... She talks about after she still, she still feels guilty for making Jen so unhappy. Um, I still care for him, but knew the only way I could leave him was to ruin myself and wait for him to be the only one to decide we part for good. We carried on TG. Um, it was a terrible time. He'd send me mixtapes of my favorite albums. How nice I thought until the songs were interrupted by Jen's voice, suppressed, saying how he needed me to come home, declaring his love for me. Um, even though I knew I. Even though I'd left, he was invading the much needed space I'd managed to put between us. Uh, I knew he was having women over to Beck Road, so I couldn't take this declaration of love and pleas for my return seriously. And besides, how could I go back after what happened? I left in all the years of abuse before that. Nothing had changed. His gestures buying me flowers for the first time ever. Cleaning the house for the first time ever. We're out of character way too late. The fact he asked me not to tell anyone about my leaving him spoke volumes. He didn't want to lose that face and thought I would weaken and go back. Yeah. It was very intense shit and Yeah, I, it's hard to read <laughs> for for me. Uh so yeah, it's not just oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, I leave. Uh, I don't know where the fuck this trip with like it's sending in post I don't know where any of this came from. I don't know. You know it, well it's so she says two weeks later, you know, I'm moving out. But yeah, that's yeah. that's the difference is to him, 
the two weeks was her like saying, I miss you, I love you, blah, blah, blah. Because she does. Uh, but for her, yeah. yeah, it was him, you know, being at home with, you know, some a mutual friend that she wanted to make sure this man child didn't fucking <laughs> hurt himself, you know? Yeah. Oh, they always say that. They're going to kill themselves, hurt themselves. But it hurt, you know, it's scary. You know. Abusive tactics. <laughs> oh, yeah. It's. Yep. So that's, you know, that that's probably my biggest one. It just. And they don't even mention the, the, you know, cozy and the baby thing, which I guess maybe I can understand glossing over. But is that not emotionally? I don't know. It's just there's just so much stuff. I know. Yeah. Yeah. I, well, like that's that's a huge thing because even even if all that was true, like if like if nothing else besides the fact that Cozy got pregnant and had an abortion, if just that core concept was the only truth there, and Jen had known about it, you would still think they would mention it in a book where they talk about, oh, I died like three times medically you know yeah (sighs) of all the important things to miss out on you know like it's kind of a big deal um i i know several women so i used to volunteer as an abortion clinic escort for women to like get past the uh abortion protesters and like None of them played it down like, oh, this is no big deal. You know, like it, it it's something they really thought about it. So the fact that Jen just, you know, don't fucking mention it. Uh, oh. That's kind of horrifying. But they bring it up when they, they kick Cozy, you know, in the genitalia and saying that you killed my baby. Yeah. Which they don't they don't give a they don't give a fuck about. It's just some it's just weird abuse power thing but the other really big thing that jen just didn't fucking mention whatsoever i don't know if it's just because this memoir is short didn't have time there's just no talk of reunion there's not really talk of the disintegration of tg besides like their fantasies of tg disintegrating um which is, it's just weird there's no actual talk because star Gristle did break up and there's multiple projects um no talk of that um and if you know, no talk of this. We'll get to this. Wait, what's that? Is that up. is that what I think it is? It is what you think, which is funny. You posted that earlier. Yeah. Uh, uh so. <laughs> I'm so immensely jealous. Anyways, yeah. Yeah. Um. That's new too. I don't. Th- <laughs> it's it's Desert Shore. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, what I thought but, it was. XTG, yeah. So, yeah, if you didn't for if you didn't know, Throb and Gristle did break up, and then you know you had Psyche TV, Chris and Cozy, Coil, um, lots of tension. Cozy does go over this in her book, Father Projects. But yeah, so TG breaks up, and then around, obviously with the internet age and newer fans of Industrial comes, you know, desire for TG to come back together, and they're like, you know what? Maybe they, but obviously, Jen has their own thing going on. And Cody talks about that, and there's money issues, and obviously feelings, and they try to put that aside. But Jen does what Jen does, and in in their memoir, they try to say like they took all the money and they did nothing and all this shit, and it's fucking ridiculous. Um. They don't even mention the reunion. They do have reunion albums, Robin Gristle. Um, they're pretty good, too. I, I like yeah. them. I think they're good. They're fun. Actually, the my first third eye movement. Yeah. So. My first Robin Gristle saw was actually something came over me, which is pretty funny. Um, anyway, yeah, there was none of that. And there was a lot of, a lot of tension because Jen being Jen happened between them and Sleazy. Um, so much that Sleazy hate, hated Jen, and so this is, they had before, and this is the Desert Shore album, so 
Sleazy had this dream of covering Nico's Desert Shore because he loved that album. And that was a project he was working on before he passed away. And it says it in Cozy's book, one of my favorite lines ever, because the tension between him and Jen got so bad because of money and just Jen being Jen that Sleazy said, I want that cunt as far away from this project as I want him. nothing to do with this project. And he said the word cunt. He hated Jen. Um, and then Sleazy passed away. And then XTG4. So XTG is TG about Jen. Because cause that's like a whole nother spiel to get into. Which Jen doesn't talk about what so fucking ever. There's not even a mention of post reunion TG or XTG. Not well, even for a second. Yeah, and that's that's the thing is like this book basically ends at what I say 2007 and all the reunion stuff happened really- between like 2002 and 2000. Yeah. Nine, if I remember right, 2010. Yeah, it was early right. 2000s. They could have, yeah, it was during that yeah. time. And there were multiple albums, there were multiple tours, um, there were exhibitions, there were retrospectives, um, like there, there was a lot, and yeah. Jen just. And you thought they didn't fucking mention it. And nothing. Not even posturing because that's when Jen got really popular and yeah. was doing like talks and interviews galore and all kinds of I mean that's when that's the point where they can really cash in on their history and stuff, which, you know, to be fair, they can and do info. Or like you said, that they, they were in my space room online. I mean Sleazy definitely was. <laughs> yeah. But then but like, you know, it's it's scary to think the old industrial people having media internet connection uh <laughs> interacting with the younger fans well, anyway um <laughs> but they were around i don't know that i think like everything else it makes sense i could see why jam would gloss over the shit and make shit up it but like just not even mentioning that era is so weird it was, to me. Yeah, it's very strange to me too. And I was actually looking forward to that. Like earlier yeah. I said, as I'm reading, I'm getting worried. I'm like, there's not a lot of room left in this book. And and normally, like I know there's gonna be a part two of like a book series or something, so I don't stress about it. But I had legit stress. Uh, when we just went from like 88 to 93 or something in the book. And I was like, um, okay, Jen, what were you doing? You know, and I, I keep reading and then it just, it burns through the nineties. Yeah. Like they're nothing, but that, that was another important time. Like the lack of psychic youth, Topi, when we say Topi, the, the temple of temple psychic, psychic youth. youth. Yeah. It's, it's like so weird. Like I wanted to read like, even if it's like an egotistical, I want to hear about how they felt like starting doing this. How did it feel running? But which they do a tiny, tiny bit, and they say they didn't like it. They didn't like being seen as like the leader and stuff. Which, but feel, <laughs> there were two I, incarnations of it. So. There's a picture of Sleazy in this. That's a <laughs> nice picture of Sleazy. Like, not gonna lie. Yeah. So off topic this is a fantastic album uh when Susie passed that not jen but chris and cozy helped produce um in dedication to him his dream to putting out to making an industrial cover of desert shore most important this is the final report (laughs) yeah which which you know which, hang on, I can you can you hold that up to the screen again? Let's see if I can. Yeah. So. Oh shit! <laughs> nice. Yeah, yeah. And it's been. I tried to finish rereading this whole thing. I can't remember the exact reasons why the ten like, hundred percent verbatim why the tension grew between uh, Jen and Sleazy, or why. They aren't part of this, but there's pretty good reason. But just Jen uh, being Jen. Uh, let me see, cause I, yeah, it 
if I remember right, Jen was requesting more money. That was uh, definitely part of it. Yeah, so he was requesting more money, and at one point he tried to like request what was supposed to be everyone's money uh, up front, and then refused to do a gig when someone wouldn't comply. Um, mm. Let's see. Sleazy got numerous emails from Jen complaining about Paul and saying that he may have to cut his losses and find a way home. Sleazy was furious with Jen about possibly leaving, explaining that we three would incur substantial financial losses if he left. He told Jen that his version of events regarding Paul was a fantasy. Please do not rewrite history of the circumstances you so feel justified in blaming Paul for everything, as this is not how it happened. Stop thinking you are victimized in some way. When we all arrived at the village underground to set up and sound check, Jen's mood had changed. He was in a private area at the side of the stage drinking wine and seemed merrier. He was even lovey-dovey with Paul, leaning on his shoulder and laughing. Um, like, screaming, which sounds... Uh, where was it? Um, okay. Control, uh, control F for cunt. See what I <laughs> Yeah, for cunt. Let me... Let me see if I can find it. That line is... Oh, yeah. Uh, okay. The desert shirt, yeah. Yep. He'd always regarded them as a reference... Okay, so let me back up a little bit. Desert Shore Project, conceived by Sleazy, was unfinished when he died, with Jen having walked out and losing Sleazy. TG in its original form was no more, and we felt that it would be a fitting memorial to Sleazy to complete his project and release it on industrial records as the final throbbing gristle album. Me and Chris made a commitment to that end. We'd had numerous email and Skype conversations with sleazy about how it would finally sound. So he could carry on from where he left off using his files and remaining true to how he had envisaged it. That caused us problems because sleazy had moved a long way away from the ICA recordings. It was no longer using the backing tracks from those sessions. He'd always regarded them as a reference and he was about to start recording guest vocals as he had originally intended back in 06. He wasn't going to use any of Jen's vocals. They were going to be consigned to history or as he said, quote, I'm not having that cunt anywhere near <laughs> Desert Shore, unquote. <laughs> oh. line was like yeah. a... So there we go. I, I love that control F cunt was what uh, found <laughs> yeah. it. So. Uh, yeah, so there's that. I, you can even see another case. And even Sleazy's so like, stop rewriting history. Stop acting like a victim. Like, cut the shit. I wish... Jen went more into the time of Tevet. I don't know if that's documented anywhere else. I don't know how much of it's true. I want to believe that, yeah, Jen and their family, like, helped all these people and helped build the temple and pay for stuff and feed them. I mean, I can believe that they did that, but, you know, it's it's, hard, it's unfortunate that we have to question it. It's hard to say. Maybe one day, you know, um, their daughters will talk about it, because I think... They should write a memoir. I would read that. Them talking about their life. It's on the run. Yeah. Talk about living yeah. in Tibet and helping. I mean, I understand that they want to stay private, but I thought that was the most interesting part of the book. And I, I do think it's really fucked up what they did to Jen. Um, so they went on. So basically, Jen went on holiday to Tibet with his, their family, because dealing with a lot of stress from Topi and all that, and they just wanted to get away. Because Jen's still like a spiritual person, they thought that would refresh them. Um, and while they were away, the police fucking raided their shit and took everything in the house. And throughout the book, and in Jen's life too, and you can even see some videos about them, is that they like to keep everything from their past. They always have document collections of all their stuff. So their house had tons of documentation of their kids and all that stuff. And the whole family life, and it was just all taken away because of like, Satanist shit, or supposed Satanist. So England had yeah. a really bad satanic panic problem. Still, they kind of glossed over that. I wanted to hear more about like 
they're I, I guess I understand not wanting to go in depth with their kids, I guess, but I wanted to hear more about their time with them and just raising them. Yeah. What they like it, and dislike and I thought the very least give us that. They spent more time talking about Lady J and their kids. I don't know. It just seems like a disconnect. Yeah, I, I was wishing for something more um, there. Just overall in general with this whole thing is like what to me felt like great areas of like intrigue and stuff uh, turns into just glossing over well, their little uh interactions with timothy leary like they seem so insignificant you know like just speed bumps or something on the road like nothing major and so yeah it just it's like these are momentous people that you're just name dropping and it's it's just like okay you know oh yeah i saw arnold schwarzenegger across the cafeteria at like i don't know yeah. a, a college gathering or something it's like okay that's cool bro whatever you know uh, i can only guess that this is just very rushed and like unedited this is just like great this is like the brainstorming phase maybe out basic outline of the memoir that was published yeah maybe that's the best excuse i can give i i out. Yeah, I would probably accept that just because, um, like, going back, you know, like you said, the Pandrogen Manifesto or um, Breaking Sex and uh, New York Story, like, just everything around this, um, around Jen felt way more thought out or at least detailed, if not yeah. thought out, and... So this this overall has been kind of a disappointing experience, and I I, I realize like even after editing this video is going to be long. So if you stuck out like this long, I hope you realize by now, dear viewer, that like there's just better resources out there. You know, um, absolutely. Go read Cozy's book at yeah. the very least. You'll right. you'll feel warmth and yeah, understand. That's what I feel. Warmth is what I felt immediately just reading it. It's just so, it's such a read, such a great time. Another thing, Jen always loves to say that they did everything. They came up, but and then they try to say they came up with the term throbbing gristle, but it's not. It wasn't Jen. It was actually that her friend left. But... Oh, I got it. Both the future band name Throbbing Gristle and the TG track Five Knuckle Shuffle, A no. Wink. <laughs> Are directly attributable to Les, who was using those terms most expressively in his storytelling sessions as early as 1972. Fox Trot admired Les's extraordinary skill at storytelling. Les, that's the Reverend, was always telling the most extraordinary stories. And you know, you'd actually pull an extreme way of expressing things. He talked about throbbing gristle. Let's talk about throbbing gristle. It was his phrase, you know, the male member. He's talking about somebody doing the five knuckle shuffle with eight inches of throbbing gristle. But see, like, and you can see above it too, it says, Their lives are a source of great ideas for which Jen sometimes took undue credit. You can see that right at the top. Uh, at the bottom now. Okay, fell asleep it's, again. It's like right above the part you highlighted. Oh, my bad. Yeah. Their lives are a great source of ideas, for which Jen, yeah, sometimes took undue took credit. Undue, or that was right here. I had that marked. I don't know what happened, but yeah. I wanted to mention that big one. I, I forgot where they mentioned it in here, but yeah, they just said they they just came up with it. So, yeah, I I don't know. It It's... It's, it's just been it's just been like the more we talk about it the less i like this book because <laughs> even in your own server earlier today i was telling someone like yeah it's an okay read but it's not that great and now i'm like i don't even think people should waste their time with it like even even as a gen like if i was still a genesis purge stan which I haven't been for years, I would say yeah. don't, don't just literally go read anything else.
So yeah, two, I gave it two. I'm gonna be a book to it. I gave it two stars. My Goodreads. Uh, yeah, but the, it was legit. Like it's been a while. Like if I didn't have to read this for this or do my my diligent duty for it, I wouldn't have fucking finished this. I would have I would have uh, DNF this as the book community calls it. Do, do not or not fin or did not finish. Did not. Yeah. Finish. Like it was. It got painful towards the end. Like, oh God. It it. it and it got painful during, like, the Lady J, which was unfortunate. The like, Lady J and even the Rick Rubin stuff. I don't, I mean, the Rick Rubin stuff was fine. It was actually interesting. But I don't know. The way it's written or them just posturing or just being born. I don't know what the fuck it was. I'm just like, God. And, like, the parts. It's like they're talking about, like, Austin Osmond spars and, like, haunted painting. Yeah. And, and I'm just like, God, I can't. This is so boring. Like, this shouldn't be fucking boring and interesting. But it is. And I can't yeah. do it. I, it's so weird for someone with such an exciting... Because they did. They had an exciting and interesting and very unique life. And this book was complete shit. Um, I put off reading i don't even think i've torn the film off of the universe is a haunted house yet and i put it off because i got a copy of this and uh i think was it you that proposed it to me or vice versa someone was like hey let's do a book discussion on non by <laughs> okay it was you okay <laughs> no. I, was, I was making sure yeah you you hit me up you're like hey you want to do a book read and do a discussion and I was like yeah sure that sounds awesome so I was like plowing through this and now I just I feel like damn like we kind of did it to ourselves like we mm -hmm. gotta finish this you know because yeah well people should know I mean yeah. you gotta do it I mean I have to do it well I have to fucking I have to go through this next I don't know how I mean, Cozy says this is a good book, but this is a lot from Jen. Like, apparently, you know, Jen is the one who did the interviews with Simon Ford or to get a lot of information. I've wanted this book for so long. I, I'm scared going into it, but I see a lot of photos. I mean, there's enough stuff actually physically documented. I hope that Simon just focuses on that. Whether personal stuff and interrelationship stuff is just from Jen, I don't give a fuck because... I can just not disregard those, but as for like the physics, the actual stuff, we'll see. But yeah, I need, I, I wanted to do this too. Cause I wanted to get a little practice in and comparing this book, you know, the gens, but this is the big one. I got to compare these two books now. Yeah. So copious I, notes, copious notes. Yeah. That'll be, it'll probably be more enjoyable than this at least. I don't see how it can be much worse. Yeah. Honestly. <laughs> I so. just, yeah. So yeah, I, I don't. I think I covered up pretty much everything I want. Oh, I, no. I was like, what am I missing? I could not tolerate it in this memoir. That they go on this whole thing of being like, it's fine being friends with Ian Curtis, all this stuff. But then, just saying that, I. So I don't know. I can't say I know a lot of lore of um, uh, Joy Division probably more than a lot of people. So I don't know if it's true. If I know Ian had, you know, had mental health issues and had a lot, de dealt with a lot. I don't know if it's true that, like, he was disjointed from his group if he didn't get along with people in Joy Division. I don't know about that and wanted to leave the group. And, like, Jen... Oh, ew. I, I, I just totally distracted because I saw a person who quoted this book was Asia Argento. But yeah, so, and then, yeah, Jen trying to say that they were so disillusioned at TG that they didn't understand them, that they were going to quit, and that, like, that only Ian understood them. They both would hang out and figure out. And, like, the whole, like, Ian was obsessed with the weeping song and would, like, sing it to them at night because it was so, like, you know, it made the feelings of suicide bubble up in them and just like all this shit and like uh, and that they were gonna form their super group they were gonna like both admit to their bands like Sinatra but like just the way even Jen just writes it and talks about it is just 
It's like it's just cringe. What page is that? On? I have to read this. The Frank Sinatra stuff. Just yeah, just them like saying they're gonna leave like the band and like. Uh, start it's two thirty-seven. Oh wait, yes, I I posted this. I guess I could have just fold it up. I just could not believe. <laughs> I could not believe what the hell I was reading. Just the way it's written is just some weird... Like schoolboy fantasy? Yeah, I don't know what this is. This is... So yeah, during this part in the memoir, this is when Jen keeps talking badly about the other TG members and that they are saying, I don't know, because obviously and Curtis is not with us, to like say how they, you know, he felt about his band, but... He's just assuming and saying that Ian Curtis felt the same way about Joy Division. Like I said, I don't know much about Joy Division. Maybe you know better than I do, but I don't know if they didn't get along. Yeah, I know a little Joy Division lore. I'm not like a diehard fan, but yeah, they they were getting along. Um, Everyone else was yeah. Everyone else was just really excited for the tour, and Ian was. Uh, very like he he had a lot of personal pressures like yeah. uh, Jen talks about it being primarily the band but it was like I think he had a daughter um, plus relationship issues plus his job was depressing as shit too so it wasn't yeah. you know it wasn't like oh man I don't want to you know be around my bandmates it's like okay I'm I'm a lead singer of a band I'm a new father, I'm depressed, uh, my job makes me more depressed, and I think he was cheating on his uh, partner at the time, too, so it, it was like a whole shitstorm of stuff. Yeah. Um, so, like, yeah, we're really just taking Jen at his, or at their word, you know, at this point that any of this happened, or Ian said any of this, so... Yeah. And so I'll just start here. The experience of John Pierre, which was um an artist who worked on album covers, and I guess Ian Curtis had asked Jen if they would do it a cover for Joy Division because he liked his work and they were friends and yada yada. Uh the experience of John Pierre had planted a seed in Ian's mind. Uh, smaller instead of bigger, taking risks instead of staying trapped in a band that had become stale to him, which again, uh, we don't know if Ian actually felt that way, if it's just Jen putting words in Ian's mouth. Um, the same way that TG had become stale to me. It was during those late night phone calls that we hatched a mischievous plan. We were going to organize a joint show in Paris where TG and Joy Division performed together. Ian, Jean-Pierre, Brian Geist, and Joy Division's manager... Rob Grenton and I would agree to keep things secret for now. The usual groupies would be there. The other six members of our two bands just going through the motions, waiting for their two lead singers to get over their little art kick and become the usual money-making spectacles again. Just just even this lot, like, I, like, this is like some fucking, like, Disney movie. Like, some, like, Disney Channel, like, music movie. Oh, we're gonna show up those, like, you know what I mean? Like, I just... Ian was laughing on the other end. He didn't laugh much, so I knew this was really amusing to him. He could really picture it. Then we all come back on stage and have a little jam, I said. Laura, he said jokingly. They wouldn't get halfway through it, I said. How about Sister Ray? It was one of our favorite Velvet Underground songs. Joy Division sometimes played it live as an encore. That's perfect, he said. And when we come back on stage, we as italicized just you and me i said and we announced we're quitting our bands and you and i are forming a new band together looking back it's bittersweet brian geisen arranged for me to talk with a booker at law palace and loved the idea rob the joy division manager gave the show a green light i had even traveled to paris to confirm everything i just like like what the fuck am i reading like I mean, did he have to travel to any of the other places that TG played at before they played? I mean, it just, yeah, it it reads like, it reads like schoolboy fantasy stuff. It's like, yeah, and we're going to quit the football team right in front of everyone. We're going to make our own sport. And they're going to be jealous because they can't play it. Yeah, there's. 
they're such meanies. They don't think we're actually cool. I'm like, like what? What is this? I mean, it, oh wait, they... I didn't. I, sorry, oh, I, I missed ahead. the part that says. But it's a show that never happened. It's the band that never was. It's an empty page and haunts me. The songs that aren't. I would have loved to hear what it sounded like. Two Frank Sinatras. I know it would have been something else. I knew it would have saved Ian. That's how close we came. Can you feel that almost erotic sense of purpose? I don't know what the fuck that means. And that exquisitely, <laughs> that exquisitely tormenting sensation of irrevocability that devoured us. We were honest to build something, in this case, an aesthetic jihad that was not already publicly desired and nobody right mind could possibly want. Like, uh, the two Frank Sinatras. Like, what? Oh, <laughs> man. The two Frank Sinatras. Which, Which I, don't, I don't know when the fuck Frank Sinatra died, but, like, Jesus Christ, man. Like, <laughs> come on, bro. Like, what the fuck? I just... <laughs> I don't understand. Why is this like... Why why are they like this? That's all... That You know what? That's what I'm just going to say, that Why are they like why this? Why are they like this? Why are you like this? <laughs> well, and that's the thing, is, like, if it was phone calls, then maybe in the Genesis Peorge archives, there are, you know, little fucking tapes of their phone calls, but... It's not like it's a public archive or it's been... I don't think it's been donated anywhere. So, oh, you know, who the fuck's going to go through it, you know? I mean, I'll go through it. Fucking give me a week. I'll fucking sort everything out, you know? Like, have it digitized <laughs> and publicly accessible. But, but yeah, no one no one else is going to be able to be like, oh, no, Ian Curtis didn't want that or whatever. So it's it's a weird fantasy. Um, I think we can at least give Jen that, yeah, they were friends with Ian Curtis, but, like, this would have saved Ian. Like, come on, man. Come on, Jen. Like, you don't have to be that cringe, bro. Like, you don't have to be that guy. Cringe section was like 293 to 296, I think, is um, fucking Jen is simultaneously like saying, Oh, we have to break norms and you can't go with what everyone else is doing, and I don't want to be rich, and then at the same time, uh, saying, I'm also a responsible father. But I go party every weekend on the other side of the country with the dominatrix. And oh, yeah. Um, yeah, and also I need more money. And it's like, how are you flying across country? <clears throat> and are you taking your daughters with you every time? You know, like, what? So, like, just that whole section reeked of uh, neglect for, you know, their children. And, uh reckless spending and it kind of smells like a midlife crisis like in retrospect you know so this i don't know what this is all about but like so there's this there's this review on this website called nika's for the for the book and they they share the same sentiments that we have on this book but there's like these two comments and it's weird, because this is what they say. Can you see it? Yeah. It says, very insightful and well-written review. And I could say with a hand on my heart that Genesis was a rancid liar, as you mentioned this review, and a viciously abusive husband. I know I was married to him for 11 years. And when I said I wanted to separate, he threatened to kill me and take our children away. And non-binary, he writes that he had full custody of our children, which he did not. I did and have the court papers to prove it. May he find peace on the side of the veil. Like, who is the... Like, is this... Apparently this should be Paula. This is just weird. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, for just like a random ass person to bring this shit up is kind of a... Uh, it's kind of revealing, I guess, because... Oh, this is her, apparently. If you click on her name... Oh, shit. It goes to this artist biography. Do you see it on my screen? Yeah. Huh. I mean, anyone could just write that, though. So. I yeah. Oh man, that should be a meme format where it's Genesis Peorge saying some freaky shit, and then right below it is just 
Peter Christopherson going, no, Jen, no. <laughs> no, Jen, yeah. I don't know, submit it to Slicky Trash Blade. I'll have to try it. <laughs> yeah. Although I don't know how much they stand Jen in there, if they know the truth or not. If it's it's like we recognize the contributions and we also admit the bad. Um, that's my take on it. Uh, yeah, I just, for my own personal taste, I just really just do not like abusive people. Like, I can tolerate edginess and, like, aesthetics or art. It, de it depends. There is a point, but I, I do. I put up with it. I can do it. But, like, any kind of actual tangible evidence and abuse in cases or whatever, I I just can't. I can't deal with it. Um, I, I love TG and his sort of stuff, but I also love it because it's, mostly, it's not just, like I said, it's all of them. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a whole big collaborative thing. Um, and yeah, uh, listen to Chris and Cozy. That's so, Chris and Cozy is amazing, and I think it's something everyone can enjoy too. There's nothing really harsh about anything Chris and Cozy. It's very just great stuff. Any final thoughts? I guess so. I can just put in the video. Um, I feel like you could you get more. Uh, like th this is just a bad book, and. Uh, you get more from Genesis literally in any other source, even in Cozy's book, even in Records of Civilization or 20 Jazz Funk Greats or the RE Search um, V Veil books, like anywhere else, you're going to get more and better information about Genesis than what you got from this memoir. So just don't yeah. buy it and you know, check out literally anything else. <laughs> and, yeah, I guess always uh, take everything with a grain of salt. Yeah. <laughs> is what we learn. Recording. Been it. You give the information, not us. Maybe we'll give you just a few extras to keep in your mind and your heart. But not on your fucking tape recorder. We don't like infection, parasites, or viruses. We don't want that kind of person in here. No, no. I'm not survivors. But sound can be one. You've got the whole damn thing here. The sound is coded. And you've got the keys. Codes. Codes. When you record them, and then you record them again, they'll keep changing. Too much DNS, not enough RNS. All I want is to crack this program with their own methods. But the old structure has to go. To demolish the harmonies, the whole fucking loser. That's why I need my tapes. I need my tapes. To crack this program. We can only give you a little information. Little bits, small elements. Maybe they'll be of use. Information to short circuit information. Okay, you've got the tapes. Keep them. And if you're really serious, tell me the story. <laughs>